And I remember being like in the strip club or whatever, in the nightclub with Rob Warner being a mischievous little bugger. And it ends up like everyone, this big fight kicks off. <laughs> and like, I'm in like face to face with a bounce, bouncer who's just to punch Sarah Jorgensen in the face. I'm like, you can't punch a girl, mate. And he's like, oh, I'll punch you instead, though. <laughs> I remember getting like punched in the head. Oh, no. And I had like this VX9000 back in my backpack, in my animal backpack, my brand new animal. <laughs> I stuffed like this massive camera in the backpack. And I'm like, turn my back on the bouncer and he's like punching my camera i'm like don't punch the camera <laughs> like turn around so i can take the punch on my face instead of punching the camera uh, just do just do whatever feels just do whatever yeah do whatever. Oh, oh i did it by accident <laughs> i wanted to do a big drum roll on a big have thing I honestly, because a lot of our a lot of our listeners are listening, so we have to explain who's here because they can't see you yet. Mm. But they have the read they have read the title already. Maybe they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they've just gone in blind. So Alex Rankin is here in the studio, very proud to announce. And uh not only is he one of the most influential people in mountain biking, for me personally, he's one of the first people that actually gave me a chance. So indirectly, I would say Alex has given me a job and a, t a round the world ticket. You're partly I I uh, have you to thank. So your your phone number is still saved in my phone as Ollie Wisley. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. <laughs> so oh mate, that's so that's cool. Where we met. Yeah. Yeah. Round of applause for Alex. Yeah, I stumbled on it a bit. No, it's it a bit nice, much, beautiful, but yeah, beautiful. yeah. It's really nice. It's almost a really difficult one to try and summarize. It is, dude. Honest. It like, is. Yeah, I think we've absolutely. Gone over it back and forth. Well, you need to say like the films, don't you? Like how. Mate, say, like, we need <laughs> to say an awful lot. Yeah, yeah I'm tough. glad you're here because, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming as well. Yeah, thank you. Lovely. Really thank appreciate you it. Absolute privilege. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. Starstruck vibes today. I'll be honest with you, but hey, <laughs> Dude, it's, it's mad, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I honestly, I was saying to Doug and Naomi, um, I remember you first turning up at the trails, and I remember what it felt like because it was like. But like I think what you did really well right at the very <laughs> beginning, and we'll get we'll get into it. But like, you captured actually what was going on. It wasn't a, a video shoot. It was like, oh, Rankin's here. Like it was like, <laughs> oh, honestly. And I, when was that though? Which re I was very young. <laughs> yeah, I was you very young, and the DMR road trip was coming through all of the dirt jumps around here. And so you just hear. Obviously, we didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have any way of knowing. So when it was happening, it was happening. Yeah, was that when I first came down to Wisley? Was that I think my first trip there? I think so. Yeah, for, for on that road trip, the DMR one. Yeah, so that was like uh, sprung. Was it in between? That was after sprung then. It was like. Um. Oh, I can't remember. So I wasn't on DMR. That's the thing. No, so I know you were just yeah, like I this trail kid. Yeah, like really young, like yeah. fourteen or something. Yeah, and, and you and Tom Lang. All the big jumps. Yeah. yeah, you and Tom Lang were sort of hanging out. So, so. Um, I think of, you know, you always have these lists of people that helped you out when you were young or whatever, and definitely like you, Tom Lang, Steve Bear, you know, right at the very beginning when there's mm. when you think like you literally think what you're doing is just well, I'd still just think of myself as like a Grebo. Yeah, same. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Tom's cool. Yeah, he was. Good. Yeah, and um, yeah, like Mike Rose is on that trip. Yeah, remember him. Yeah. On the be on it. Obviously you remember him. Right. Uh <laughs> he's still around. And um yeah, who were the riders? Like um Gav Shortle. Ross Ross Tricker. Ross Tricker. Luke Smith. Was Luke on that trip? Maybe not actually. Donny. I can't remember. I remember Chico Hook. Yeah. Uh I mean to me and and again, the the crazy thing is that like when, when you rolled in, it wasn't just it was all the people that you'd put on the videos. That became my like mm. inspiration almost. Yeah. So yeah. they were all turning up at the trails. Oh. Uh, okay. To to okay. unpack a little bit, right? Because I, I am a mega sprung. I'm a mega fan. You probably didn't, haven't realised until this moment, right? So, <laughs> growing up, um, my brothers both skated, and I watched four one one, and I rode mountain bikes, and I wished I had a four one one. And so when in the back of Dirt magazine, I think there was a sprung one. Video magazine. You'd put video magazine mm. underneath it. Mm. That to me was like, right, this is it. Now my sport is cool. 
Yeah, no way. Yeah, 411 yeah. was the coolest thing. It had yeah. all the good music, it had all of the core mm. stuff, it had all of the skaters. Mm. And so Sprung came out Yeah. then. Like, to me, that was just mind-blowing, and we pre-ordered it with... You remember you to, used to have to fill out the yeah, form? Yeah, yeah, send, send it Send it in. off in the post mm. or whatever? Mm. I can't remember how... Did that go directly to you? Probably, yeah. Would it have done, yeah? yeah. You got yeah, all these early envelopes. On, yeah, early on it was, because we did all the distribution ourselves. But it, it was funny you mentioned 4 one because I went in... I used to watch that. I was a skater kid uh, when I was, like, 13, 14... <clears throat> and four and one came along a bit after that because it was all like Pal Peralta videos, yeah, Santa Cruz videos. Like Stacy Peralta was like my my hero, like filmmaker hero. And um, I just the, I really I really, I was aware of the effect that the videos we watched had on us and like our group of friends. You know, you get one from borrow one from the local skate shop. We'd all go around a mate's house and watch it, and then go outside and just skate like maniacs or whatever <laughs> and just keep you going for, for weeks and weeks on end so from a young age I was like aware of the power of the video yeah um, <coughs> so when then, did so you were in skate you were into skating yeah and that lasted sort of like till I was about 14 and a half and I got attacked <laughs> by a, a guy kicked me um, pushed me over and kicked me on the street that I used to skate in because they used to hate us skating there and stuff, like these old people. And, um, <laughs> I think every yeah. skater <laughs> I used to deal so, with that, I think, as well, right? So and it kind of, like, it didn't, like, stop me loving skating at all, but that was, like, the one spot we had. And it was, like, outside, my best mate who skated, it was, like, outside his house. So it wasn't like we were sort of taking liberties for hours and then, like, yeah. some random house. Um, it just happened that this guy lived there and he hated us. He used to come out we make like little kickers that were like you know that high and just do fly offs and stuff and you come out and drive over them in this car and it'd just be like all the local kids playing in the street Ugh. so it was mad and then one time i was on my own down there and he came out and pushed me over and uh, kicked me on the ground yeah it was pretty gnarly actually and then <laughs> what a weird and then bloke. and my best mate who lived there he moved away and then i saw him we were driving through his village once <coughs> like not long after I was like oh no what happened to David no, I haven't seen him around for ages and then driving through the village where he'd moved to and he was on a mountain bike and he was like waving he was like pointing at his bike he's going get a bike get a bike and I was still like hardcore into skating and um, just dreaming of skateboarding yeah and then that was kind of when the mountain bike revolution was sort of like hit the UK and of course I wanted a mountain bike anyway and I had a picture of a rally Mustang on my school book you know, laminated on like the rally mustang advert. <laughs> i thought that was like a really cool bike didn't really know much about them and then um bought a second hand muddy fox off this kid um chris roberts was absolutely shag <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> struggled on with that then i got a purple kona syndicone after like you know when you're a kid and you just pour over catalogs yeah and for hours I mean, and hours and hours want i had like the splatter really paint know. kona um catalogue and I got the one the year after that it's like yeah. straight purple what was it about skateboarding that drew you to skateboarding then uh well I don't really it's like my mum brought home like a little penny sort of type looking board mm. from a car boot sale and I just took to it straight away I just kind of like went outside the front of the house and just determined to sort of like get the hang of it on my own yeah and then my friend from the year below me at school lived opposite and he's like, oh, I've been skating with this kid down, down the road. He's really good. You know, he should come out. And <laughs> I remember going down with this knackered five quid penny board and then just, yeah, upgrading. And I guess it's like the technical aspect of it. Yeah. Skating is sort of like a little bit technical, isn't it? And then it's kind of like pushing yourself, mm. you know, um, you know, we used to do like acid drops, just like dropping off stuff and, yeah. You know, and you can p progress quite quickly with that, can't you? And do, I was sort of like, I remember thinking, oh, you know, I could do one this high, and I was like really pleased with myself. And it's just kind of that, that thing, you know. It's making something of nothing as well, isn't it? If you're mm. like, if if you've got that sort of brain, I mm. feel like skateboarding is really good. Mm. But a lot of sports are. But like mm. being able to just find a horrible car park yeah. and yeah. make it. Into or you, it. Could, yeah. you like play all day. Yeah, all day, yeah. Thing. I guess I was kind of like a skinny kid. 
and I wasn't into like football and rugby that much yeah. stuff like that like some kids it was like their identity wasn't it yeah. yeah you know like and for me I guess skateboarding could become a little bit of my like what I attached with and stuff so um <clears throat> and I just yeah I used to buy all the magazines and pour over that and the culture you know the it was like looking into a different world wasn't it like the American yeah. scene in California it was just incredible like to see all that as a UK kid from a village and Dude, especially back then, eh? mm. it was like. Mm. Yeah. And then I guess if you want to go deeper into it, like, um, like why do kids sort of pick up on different sports? I guess, you know, I guess I was a little bit insecure um, from my um, parents splitting up and stuff like that. Mm. And I think like kids like that kind of gravitate towards, you know, um, those kind of sports. I think generally. That's interesting. I think there's like a whole other level of that. We don't have to get into that too no, much. No, I find I find that I find it fascinating. I've never really thought like, about. I what. bet a lot of people don't. I'm just uh, get this pillow. There's a lot as well. A lot of people it? don't really like aren't aware of that. And like I'm yeah. a bit older now, mm. and I can kind of look back and sort of say that, you know, um, interesting. That. You know, from a more grown up sort of look back at how yeah. you were when you were a kid and stuff. So who was it who talked about that? It might have been Paul talking about people gravitate towards action sports if they've maybe like not got a father figure or something like had that a little bit of trauma like, really? to get like yeah, had, l- had some trauma as well yeah like yeah so i've never thought about myself I, I, similar like my parents split up although mm. they were lovely like they stayed really good but mm. i don't know i think there's also for me i don't know if it's the same for you but it was like ingrained in our family that like two wheels was the thing that you just did as well oh, but if yeah. you're not from a family like that as well it maybe more like rugby or football or no. more traditional sports. <clears throat> yeah, my dad was like mad into rugby. Yeah. But never really, like I didn't, I remember starting rugby at school and I didn't even really know the rules. <laughs> you know, he didn't like... Um, Running put, and hugging, innit? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Bath time fun, innit? <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um, I, I, um, I, I was sort of quite... I remember starting rugby and loads of the kids would bang into it at big school. I wasn't really like, yeah, you know, like I said, I didn't really, what's a fun ball? You know, well, like, like, pass it, you know, I was yeah. like, I just grabbed it, it was brilliant. And they're like, no, no, you didn't do it right, you didn't catch it right. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but where's the freestyle and that? You know, I, was like, <laughs> I feel like we got like, in England especially, we got like only a certain number of options that are like accepted. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Like, it feels way more op- oppressive, I think. When you're, I remember being at school, I've never gravitated towards the sports that everyone plays. Mm. Yeah, I never have, and it's yeah. not through being like, I don't know. It's just I didn't like football. Yeah, because I didn't want to fiddle around with my feet, and I it felt didn't cool want to run to be and the hug. kid that did the thing that no one else was doing. I guess yeah, yeah. there was that as well. Like yeah. the more that yeah. like people didn't understand it for me, like the more I lent into it. Of like they don't know like those brands that you're wearing to school. Like they don't know. They're all wearing the same stuff, the Umbros or whatever it was at the time, and you've mm. got yeah. box t-shirt being different, and they're just a bit like, of a misfit. Yeah, yeah, and you were happy in that as yeah. well because you, you had that whole backup behind you. Of yeah, what they don't know. They don't know about this scene that's out there. Like it's I, really cool. I um, I think uh, what was it? Do you see Kez? Have you seen Kez? The film that came to my head when you were talking about football. No, I you know, actually, Ken, yeah. Lo- Ken Loach film. Some people know what I'm on about. Yeah. But yeah, there's a school teacher on there. Yeah. He's like the football teacher and he makes it all about him. You know, he pretends to be like Bobby <laughs> Charlton or whatever playing football. And he just uses the kids as like his sort of like to fulfill his dream. And like PE felt like that to me. Like if you yeah. look at that on YouTube, the Kez football scene, it's hilarious. <clears throat> it's a really, really good film. So, so yeah, we could talk about like where I went to film college and stuff after that as well because that's why yeah quite often like reference old films and stuff well when did you um when did you actually pick up a camera was that during skateboarding or not no not at all like um we used to have just take like you know snaps on like our home cameras and that of each other and then um but yeah uh i picked up a camera not until like it like we didn't really have like camera. I was kind of didn't have a load of cash when we were growing up. I was kind of like pretty, like poor, yeah. <laughs> but not like, like it wasn't like I was poor, poor. But the camera was luxury, wasn't it? You didn't have a phone camera. It's not like now, you know, where kids have stuff no. like loads of shit. Like we just like my skateboard lasted like ages, yeah, ages and ages. You know, like, and the whole time I skated, I only had like two boards. 
I think. You know what I mean? So, I'm, I'm like, now, like, they just get through them and I, like, looked after my stuff and then the same with the bikes and stuff. So, um, yeah, I guess you just went through, like, GCSEs, didn't you, and did all that. And they go, oh, what do you want to do? I don't know. And I did work experience. I had a really nice teacher and she got me work experience at the Wyvern Theatre in Swindon. And um, so I was doing drama. I did drama at school and I was like only one of two boys at the whole school that did drama and uh I like those uh, odds I, I like those odds I don't know why I, I don't know why I picked it and um <laughs> uh yeah so I ended up the Wyden Theatre and when I was there it was a brilliant experience absolutely brilliant and the, um, there was a girl there who was a couple of years older than me and she was doing um like media style A-levels at the local college and I straight away I thought that's what I want to do. You know, she did like photography A level and something else like sociology type thing to make it kind of like a media vibe. Yeah. And then um, so I was like, right, I'm going to go and do that. So I knew straight away. And then um, it was great because I then I knew what to focus on with my GCSEs. I knew how to do well in English. And then I was kind of like you know average student really. You know, and um, with direction though. And then it now. just helped me, you know, loads. And then by the time I came to do the, the course at Chippenham, it was like they changed it to a, a national diploma, which is what they call like a B-Tech type thing. I think they're still around now. And it was wicked, you know, you just went there and there's loads of like-minded people and you just got to mess around with edit suites and cameras and, and I was just straight in on it. And I remember going for the interview and, uh, you know, like real young, really, you know, 16, 15 probably at the time because I was like <clears throat> real young from like a June baby, so I'd have gone to college, one of the youngest ones there, straight off, no gaps or anything, and um, in the interview, the guy's like, oh, you're interested in skating and biking, you know, that'd be something to focus on when you're filming, so if I was like, you know, I was thinking right. in the back of my head, I was thinking that, you know, it'd be something, wouldn't that be the ultimate job? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> sick. you know what I mean? So, but during the, the two years in Chippenham College, I used to get the bus there like every morning. There was no bus from my village yeah. um, except for one that left at like 10 to 7 in the morning. So I had to get up and it'd be like an hour and a half on the bus every day there and back. So it was like three hours on the bus every single day to go to this college and there was no way out. So like if I wanted to go home early because there was no lessons or whatever, I couldn't. Oh. So I spent every hour at Chippenham College right. just and then you don't never to be you'd end up just messing around with the kit. Oh, I may as well finish that project then. What did you know the kit I mean? So we like did then? really okay. well, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And it was just, you were there with the other people that were just there all the time as well. Yeah. And that was cause they, because most of them didn't have that restriction like I did. They actually wanted to be there. Right. So I was there <laughs> hanging out with all the kids that wanted to be there, doing yeah. really well at this course. Right. And a lot of the people on the course were older. So they weren't like all 16-year-old idiots, 17-year-old idiots like you get when you go to A-levels. Everyone's just like, eh, sixth form, eh. Like, <laughs> I don't know what sixth form is like, but I guess. <laughs> like that, I think. I don't know. Like, though, yeah. I don't know. Everyone, either. Listen, <laughs> everyone like listening to Blur and shit like that. But, um, <laughs> yes, uh, dude. <laughs> it was all like older kids, you know, older students. Yeah. And like grown adults as well. Oh, like wow. who'd gone back and like, oh, I'm going to go and do this media course. So yeah. you're mixing with like really, really interesting people that had actual life like. life experience. And yeah. Yeah. And then from there, I went to Chippenham, uh, sorry, Plymouth uh, Uni. I thought I wanted to do diving. I did like this whole dive course at Chippenham thinking I was going to do underwater photography, oh, really? vi video yeah. filming. And then I did the, did all the stuff in the swimming pool and then went to um, like the open water diving bit and you go 10 meters down. I'm like, bloody hell, this is like, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, it was a bit, I like, actually liked it, but I had like really, really bad ears. Like I couldn't cope like physically. Right. I wasn't sure if I had a bit of a cold at the time. I came up and there was like blood in my mask and all that. And it was just really gnarly. And, um, way to make a living and it was like <laughs> every day, the pain, the pain was like insane. And yeah, I was just I like, I'm not sure if I want to test this again, you know? Um, so I just, packed it in but ended up going to Plymouth anyway and it was really good it really it was like one of the best media courses in the country apparently and what was the goal of it being underwater why was that why 
diving for dive. Yeah, you why? Mean? Why? Because <laughs> you look at fish what, and stuff. Literally, just like nature documentary sort of thing. I guess so. Yeah, there's yeah. like a whole there's a whole sort of segment in there of like yeah. underwater media sort wow. of specialists. You know that it's interesting. You know, that's not so. action. What you en- ended up doing is it? That's no, not it's like kind of like like a fun activity though, isn't yeah. it? It's like you know living. You know, sort of you're gonna get to do it in rad places. And, yeah. And um mm. and I've definitely in- always been like loving on you know wildlife stuff as well. Like yeah. It's just sort uh, of um, what uh, Ollie mentioned something just before. Like what did it, what did that kit look like? What was yeah. the first camera you picked up? Oh <clears throat> well, it would have been my. I mean, my dad had like a VHS camera where you yeah. put like a small VHS tape in, yeah, 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 yeah and remember. it would like go into an adapter and it would make it like a big VHS. Tape. What were they yeah. called? VHSC or something it was called oh, was VHS it? Yeah. Compact yeah. right and then um, yeah my dad had that and then before that actually my granddad he, he had a, a Super 8 camera oh, so I remember yeah. like um, and he used to have like Super 8 evenings when we were really little you filmed on Super 8 yeah yeah, yeah I used Super 8 quite a, quite a lot and um, and then uh, yeah so that was probably an underlying influence there yeah I remember he'd set up the projector and watch the home videos and then and my sister was really into like grabbing the camera and like running around with it and I was kind of maybe a bit jealous like I wanted to run off some film and do that as well so when we were younger <coughs> That's cool. so what did an editing what does an editing suite look like back then yeah like you said you spent all the like time in the editing tape, suite I don't know what it would even tape tape machine so it'd be like you had a little cubicle you go in and they have like um, two VHS machines yeah. hooked up to a little controller little Sony controller or Panasonic and it would have in and out points you could set with the time code. So everything with tape based is all based around time code, which relates to a specific time on that tape. So how do you, how do you play and then, back then? And then it'd oh, be in and out. You had a little like jog shuttle and they'd just rewind and forward go. Right. <laughs> like that, yeah. yeah. So you've got yeah. the two tapes. Yeah. I'm sorry. To, I'm so you have a master tape. You have a yeah. master tape. So, so we had two machine at Chippenham and then they had like the three machine edit suite, which was like the special one where you could do proper edits. So you have like a master tape. It takes me back, you know, to like, this is <laughs> what I was like mastered it though. You know, yeah. I was like proper, like one of my special skills was tape based editing. You know, right. by the time I left Plymouth, yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I'm like, you know, all right. And then all of a sudden it was like, nah, sod that. It's nonlinear editing you know we knew it was coming but yeah um so what was so like sprung on, sprung yeah. one was non-linear you know it was a, we, we did right. that on avid um non-linear edit suite but at the same time all the production companies were still shooting tape base still editing tape base but we sort of like we went straight into that non-linear but yeah so you'd like i mean you could sort of spend the next sort of 20 minutes me trying to explain <laughs> <laughs> vintage style editing but yeah you you basically lay it down on the master tape yeah and you build it with your other tapes so you've got all the footage here on various tapes and then you you just swap the tapes so and get the bit copies what, what you want onto yeah a, onto yeah a master, yeah so and then you're layering yeah stuff. yeah so you sort of trying to and as you do it you try to minimize the generation loss because each time you you, ah, you do, yeah, the quality yeah. would degrade a little bit each time you copy 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 so to achieve certain techniques you have to copy back and then you get what you want ah, yeah. but generally you could just do it one generation one generation like that yeah and then uh you know some people at college they focus on film but i always knew i wanted to do i was more like tv guy i wanted to yeah. do like i was interested in live tv production and the same they had like tv shows like the big Big Breakfast and and stuff like that. It was like well, live TV was changing in the UK, yeah. and it was a big part of like youth culture. And I was like really into like youth TV, like youth, like yeah. things like Dance Mania and Live and Kicking. <coughs> yeah, the Word was like a TV oh, the show. Word, yeah. yeah, I've heard. Yeah. I, I, I remember seeing that. Yeah, I remember Big Breakfast. I don't remember the other two, but yeah, Denise yeah. Van Out and Chris yeah. Evans on it. I remember yeah, Denise uh, Van Out here, right? Chris Evans. Yeah. Um, Johnny Vaughan was like the Johnny Vaughan. Yeah, yeah, he was he was alright. And um, but I guess it was sort of like I came through like TV was a big part of my generation's life. Yeah, you know, like coming through, it was always like come. Um, yeah um i never really wanted to do mainstream stuff though you know it was always about just 
Mm. I wasn't really interested in. Um, was was um, was like Big Breakfast that not working for me? Is what you mean? Yeah, that it was really, but it was sort of like like a sub. I was I was sort of interested in TV from a youth culture point yeah. of view, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, is MTV a thing then? No. Pardon? MTV. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like eighties, didn't they start yeah, early so mid? You had to have Sky though, eh? Yeah, we didn't yeah. have that. Yeah, because no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you used to have to literally plumb in a satellite for Sky, didn't you? you yeah, you know, like people that had Sky had just like a massive one. Of <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Elon Musk. Yeah. Oh, they're rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that reminds me of like like a big part of the mountain bike coverage, like jumping ahead quite a bit. Like a lot of the mountain bike racer kids, like Steve Pete or Will Longden and stuff, they all had Sky, and they used to watch, like Eurosport, like mountain bike coverage. And I didn't ha know anything about that. No. So when I came up with like the idea of doing the video magazine, it was kind of like I didn't really know there was like yeah. a load of. T I knew it existed, but I didn't know what it was like. I didn't have an opinion on it at all. You so were creating the coverage. So and similarly, I didn't like have a load of other people's. Video. I mean, there weren't a lot of videos, and we can talk about that in a bit as well. I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, like I remember, like going into the local bike shop, um, seeing a copy of Props. Um, I think, oh, there's a video magazine for BMX, is there? You know, like, and um, I knew about Four and One from my skate days, and. Um, I just grabbed it. I just bought it straight away. And it was after I finished uni. Oh, and right. I was kind of looking for something to do. I was you like, I left uni and I was just working for my dad, like painting and decorating, just trying to figure out what to do. And like, in the meantime, like you buy like the Guardian and has all the media jobs in the back on a Monday. And uh, I was just applying for jobs, like running jobs in London or this job here. And, and I was just like, just some, still just some young guy from a village who didn't really know anyone other than yeah. the contacts I'd made at uni and all the great time I'd had at, at uni and then um so I was applying for these jobs I didn't really want wasn't ever going to get because such as it was like there's so much nepotism in that scene anyway or um I just I uh, was looking for something to do you know and I guess like my stepdad was like a entrepreneur he started his own business and I kind of was always a little bit in, you know influenced by that him and my mum started their own business. I was like, always had that in the back of my mind. So that was like quite a positive influence from, from that side of things. And um, yeah, so I just thought maybe that's, that's the hook. You know, that's my hook for getting into the scene because there was already like a couple of mountain bike films that I was aware of. And I just didn't feel like being a, from the UK, we could straight up just smash out like a like a quality mountain bike film that could stand up against the stuff that I was aware of. Mm. A lot of it I hadn't even seen because I didn't have like a big budget for going out and buying like <laughs> latest films or whatever. Yeah. Um, it was Chainsaw, wasn't there? Yeah. That, was, yeah. that had come out and then there was like... The, packaging the, that. I like yeah, the packaging Yeah, great that. branding, but yeah. I, hadn't, I hadn't even seen it, Yeah, you know, before I started Sprung. And then... Wow, that's yeah, sick. So, so I, but I had seen like the UK stuff. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't think we could quite stack up straight away against that. I'd seen Mud Cows, yeah. which I loved. Yeah, I really loved, loved that. Mud Cows felt like you were actually there, didn't it? And then, um, uh, and then there was the MBUK stuff, wasn't there? So you had like tricks and stunts, dirt, and chain spotting. Yeah, chain spotting. So, um, and I didn't feel like we could really just go straight out and do that, or me personally. So, so the the sprung the the video magazine element was like kind of gave us our angle, yeah. So you could sort of take the pressure off a bit, and I thought right, we'll do like four a year, and make it like less good in some ways. You know what I mean? Like and just go out and do our yeah. own thing, you know. So like the first, so <coughs> if I start from the start, I I phoned up Milan, who was my partner, the co-founder of Sprung, and he was my um, one of my best mates from Plymouth. Um, college. I've never uh, met him, but I know he's Milan Spazic, right? Yeah, Milan, Biker as well. Yeah, yeah, he's Milan right. Spazic. Yeah, and he um, he came up to me at college and said, "Oh, you've got a mountain bike." I was thinking of getting one, 
I'm like, I was thinking of getting this KHS or something. Um, do you want to go riding? Yeah, you know, like, definitely, like, just, he used to see me ride into college on my, my Kona. And then we were just mates from there, really. You know, we used to go riding. He had a car. He was, like, a lot older. He was, like, a mature student. Came from um, Serbia. And, um, yeah, just had this plan, this goal, just to get to America, I think. <laughs> he ended up there. <laughs> like, he achieved his dream. Rad. Um, still now, yeah. Yeah. Works in film. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. He still, like, dabbles in film and stuff. Yeah. But, um, he's got all, like, a became like a red owner and like does all like commercial stuff mm. and things like that so had you already started buying your own equipment like when do you start so well the camera that? thing was like that comes off like the next bit of the story really you know i mess phoned up milan i said what do you think he's like yeah yeah we'll give it a go probably like a bit skeptical not maybe not quite sure how serious i was but we'd spent like a year and a half like riding like most weekends like hanging out and we'd seen together the scene change and grow into like XC, we were like full on XC. So like, oh, I'm gonna take my bar ends off and, and uh, put some riser bars on. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's all right, isn't it? And then oh yeah, put some yeah short stem. Oh yeah, that's all right. <laughs> you know, oh chain device, what's that? You know. So <laughs> and then all of a sudden he turns up at my house. He's like, oh, I've just bought this. And he turns up with a brand new like Kona full sus thing. Wow, how'd you get that? Oh my god, like you know, just like the wildest thing. And then um. So we saw the team progress, yeah, like together. And then we'd always talk about doing something like, because we were on the same course, you know, doing the video thing. And uh, um, so we we could see where it was going. And then for me to call him up sort of six six months after, well, four, four or five months after we left um, college, after the course ended, and for me to say that, he's probably like, Oh yeah, yeah. We will, we should do that. You should do that thing we've been talking about the whole time. Mm. And how are we going to do it? So I went to my mum, convinced her to lend me some money. So she had a took out a loan, sixteen hundred quid loan, to buy me this camera that I'd seen and trade it <laughs> in Bristol, which was like the you know vlog it magazine, yeah, <laughs> really? you know, like the free ads, yeah, you know, like yeah, paper yeah. thing, Friday ad, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, call them up, so I'd seen this, seen this camera in there, yeah, Sony VX9000. And I drove over, looked at it, and yeah, and paid this guy cash for this camera. And uh, and that was it, really, you know. And I said to Milan, look, I bought this camera, and it's like the latest Sony DV thing, and uh, it's the VX9000. It's better than the VX1000, uh, which all the skaters use. Mm. Yeah. Um, which is now like the iconic camera yeah, that yeah, yeah. you know um, and he says oh wow yeah let's do it then you know serious right and then he went down the local like you know like pawn shop if you like down in Plymouth and there was one the similar one but it was the DSR 200 and it was like a grand more and it's like exactly the same as my camera but the pro version the, D yeah. the DV cam version so mine was DV and Sony did what was called DV cam, which is 25 megabits per second, whereas the DV is 20 megabits per second data rate, which is dealing with like minute data rates compared to like what you got here. But that's the diff. That was like um, the difference between those. It's real, yeah, geek, yeah, real yeah. geeky. But yeah, his was like this one was like all black. Mine was like grey, and his was all black and had like XLR imports for proper like audio in. So. Yeah. Yeah, and anyway, he like bought it, and so we had. Amazingly, we had like the same looking cameras. They were all identical cameras, really, but um, and it was like really good for like what we wanted to do. You know, you could like it was designed to be a shoulder mount right. version of the VX thousand, but as a bigger sensor, so it let a bit more light in. And then um, or was it the same size sensor? I can't remember. But um, so they've got gnarly zooms, haven't they? Is that right? Am I? Yeah, you had like yeah. a really good trigger zoom, like on a on a grip that you'd hand like this and do yeah, like yeah. ENG style. But what we did, we like wedged it in our, like a uh, rifle butt and then used the trigger, like used the fig, like the zoom finger there and then pulled it in. And then you could look through the eyepiece yeah. <clears throat> to keep it real steady. And it just happened to be the perfect camera for pan and zoom filming. Right. You wow. could just like, 
and like yeah really fast zoom and i think maybe i had a little bit more zoom range than the vx1000 but rather than going like that with the whole camera to your eye it's still i mean vx1000 format is still great you, but you just had this like rifle way of filming which just was was um i don't know i guess guess it helped with the branding a little bit when people saw us out and about and i remember the first race we went to nat Quarry. And I was I'd be real self-conscious of the, having such a big camera, <laughs> you know, and I had this, like, brown bag that my friend gave me. I pulled it out, it looked like this, like, real official, like, brown bag, and I pulled it out. And, Here like, is oh, the BBC. Yeah, and then, like, people, like, I remember I pulled it out, and the f- first thing I heard was, like, oh, you've got a big enough camera, mate. <laughs> Just some guy, like, why would you even say that? And then, like... Were you riding so as well? I just, would you go and do both? Ride, or, yeah, or were no, you there just filming? No, like? I never separate, never did that. Milan right. used to, Milan had a little bit more funds than I did, and he had like downhill bikes, and uh, and uh, yeah, you know, he could buy the camera and all that stuff, so he raced downhill, okay, and like he influenced like so I think a, a lot of people make that choice, did. it seems like, Filmers yeah, go, right, I'm not gonna be a pro rider, yeah. I'm gonna go down the yeah. filming route, but you just went. I just went full, like, one all my money almost. was going on the filming, and that was it. I had my orange P7, which I had the last year of uni. I used to work at Halford, so I spent all my money on that. And then that converted that into, like, this downhill rig. You know, slam. <laughs> ex- just, like, literally <laughs> yeah. just raked out the head angle. Well, not even. I had, like, 80 <laughs> mil travel. Oh, OK, fair enough. Uh, Rock Shock <laughs> Judy's. I've still got it all, you know. And then, yeah, I just used to do that. And I got into, I got into more, like, Dirt jumping. Yeah. So I went that way. I used to dirt jump and then I got a BMX, like one of the sponsors I swapped to add on sprung for a BMX. Right. So I just got into dirt jumping in, in the village, you know, so I didn't have to drive. I could just just it's almost like skating. Dig and ride. Yeah. yeah. It's like really you know, it's like village skating. Yeah. It's like wood like, like dirt jumping I mean, like, is like village skating. The village yes. idiot. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> ad break. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the ad break. These are the Adidas 510 Trail Cross GTX. What does GTX stand for? Gore-Tex, are they? That's right. Now, Gore-Tex is what we're going to be testing today. Mm. It's the waterproof nature. Yeah. We need to try and get this across both visually and in audio. Yes. What we're going to need is reality of UK biking, which is a river. Awesome. Let's go. Let's go. I'll go first. Look at that. <laughs> First test down. We're cooking on gas, dude. Ollie, mate. Yeah. Why are we pushing up this hill? These um, stealth rubber soles have like a bit on the toe yeah. that's purposefully what we're doing right now. It's working. Do you know any good trails, like around here? Yeah, here. Oh. <laughs> Final test. Then a bunny hop over a log into a swamp. All right, let's get it. We could have just not gone riding and just walked around in this puddle. The Adidas 510 Trail Cross GTX. Right, I remember being at Banbury, uh, King of Dirt. And you were filming, I think, on that camera. Um, you were filming lightning. You were trying to get lightning, and every time you'd off, yeah. And <laughs> you know what I mean. Every time you'd off camera, the lightning would come, and you'd be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd and then you'd be filming again, and nothing, and then off. And then I remember seeing it in. You used the clip, yeah, in one of the movies. Oh, is that Earthed? I think yeah, so. Yeah, eh? Four Cross, where um, Scott, yeah, um gets uh yeah uh, taken out the dale holmes bit with scott and it did he get taken out it was like a collision or dale was just like a real rough pass when it went yeah. dale was like um scott was always you know leaving a bit too much space <laughs> i think uh sometimes too nice you know, too nice, too nice. Mr. nice. Yeah. still yeah i remember actually if you want to go into that uh at the premiere for earthed one I, uh, I was really nervous because Scott was there 
and I'd done that whole bit in the earth one where like the, the music stops and it's like mm, I can't remember what I did exactly but it's like um, really focused on um, Dale putting the move on him yeah 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 <laughs> and I remember saying to Scott like before I'm like oh there's something in the film you might not like it and all that and then afterwards Scott was like really chill he's like oh no it's fine yeah it's really good <laughs> I can imagine so, oh, I've got a question for you I yeah. thought during the break so, for me growing up, Dirt Magazine, Sprung Magazine, Earth, they were like 411, uh, Thrasher, Sidewalk, Stab Magazine. Like, they're all like these kind of, uh, they were so influential because they were like, what's cool laid yeah. out in front of you? Yeah. Like, what is actually cool we in. Great culture. And, and it was like so exciting when sprung and dirt when i discovered these things it was like yeah exactly they create culture and they give you like guidelines to what's cool what was informing because i mean you could have gone off and filmed some kooky stuff wow. what what made you what made you film the stuff that you thought were i don't know how did you navigate mountain biking well, it's kind you? of like we progressed through it didn't we i mean if you look at sprung one it's all on youtube and that it was there was kooky stuff in there. There's, you know there's I mean? also Steve Gill. There was, there was, but we didn't get. We just sort of like. Um, we both knew what we liked, Milan and I, um, and we'd sort of like. I guess we're both really critical guys. Yeah. <laughs> just really like, and then so we'd be quite strict. We didn't want to just put any rubbish in. You know, we want people to buy this thing. Yeah. You know and. Sprung one, we just turned around real quick. Nine weeks, we made it start to finish, literally. Wow. Yeah. So we like looked on the calendar. I'm, I remember Milan like planning it out. You know, like, looking at the calendar and then, and oh right, well we better do a logo then. You know, and he sat at his computer doing the logos yeah. and like just figuring it all out. And then, um, so sprung yeah, one, you had so a plan. It was just mad. I mean, I guess because we just came out of uni. We were like, we were organised, you know, yeah. motivated. I and mean, we didn't want to waste that, you know. And we knew, like, what it took to to do these things. And then, um, so, yeah, in terms of content, to start with, we were, like, scrabbling around looking for, like, what we could get to go in. You know, we had no contacts with the bike industry at all. Right. You know, nothing. So, so um, who was it? Milan knew this guy, Chris Quigley, who was... Um, uh, had some contact with 4130 right. you know like I think he was going out with um, someone who worked there yeah that's all we knew right <laughs> yeah. so it's, I could I know more now wasn't Link Lincoln there wasn't LinkedIn there wasn't no. Facebook <laughs> no yeah. he was he was um, he was actually Mark and Chris Noble's um, brother-in-law right so but we didn't know that um so he knew of a guy he knew of steve gill like we knew we thought that was a way in you know so right yeah, so how do you get in touch so with yeah these people? so yeah. we got we got gilly's number messaged yeah. him and of course he was up for it yeah <clears throat> and then um and so so yeah so we got chris down to do the interview so that so in sprung one chris is the guy doing the interview yeah so um go ask him about being bunny hop world champion yeah 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 and we were like mm, uh probably a bit of a mistake but <laughs> you had to sort of go over there yeah didn't you really it's but um see i don't view it as that that to me was just the thing that, yeah that was well we kind of knew that we knew at the time steve didn't want that to define his career right. so we didn't we <laughs> yeah. yeah we were still, as, we, I still I think, mention it every time <laughs> <I see yeah. laughs> well i think you know we think milan and i both really well read on the scene so yeah so we used to pour over the magazines. Yeah. Like, even Milan was like 30s, late 30s. I was like, you know, 21. And I'd spent the last, from the age of 16, reading every single magazine, cover to cover, that I could get my hands on. So which one so, was that? Well, to start with, it was MBUK. You know what I mean? But we, mm -hmm. you know, and you were like... And then Dirt obviously came along and is like, oh, thank fuck for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but we owe a lot to MVUK. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, um, uh, and 
we advertised in that and yeah. we, for a short period of time. I mean, MBUK really created the scene, <laughs> but, but it really did. Like when you, we were watching um, yeah. Sprung two. two, yeah, and it had the bike show in, and it was just like that was MBUK's show. Yeah, really wasn't it? Oh like, yeah, I mean the, the show, readership was massive. The show was amazing. I mean, when yeah. we took like Sprung one to the to the show and sold you know a few copies with just like one ad in the all, all we had time to get out because that was our why well, we did it in nine weeks because we want to smash it out for that so show. bike 98 right um so um yeah so we had a little tv on a friend stand with a sign underneath saying sprung video 15 quid or whatever and that was it that was the only presence we had at the whole of that massive show yeah just one little tv which we had to pay money to rent you know because they had to all come from the nec facilities yeah, yeah. couldn't just bring our own tv and put it on it had to be <laughs> yeah. like so we had to pay a load of money for that and then we had I had a thousand sprung videos that I bought pre-bought and I'm um, putting my mum's Citroen XM. She had this like car that, that was big enough to like load up all these videos in, you know. And then, uh, you know, it took like a load in my polo, in my little red polo <laughs> to NEC. How confident were you that it was going to like do what it it's did? It's a big investment, uh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, we had no idea. It was like, yeah, it was crazy. And then... Um, <laughs> I mean, look and, back and at the we had a lot of people. What I was <laughs> nervous about was we only had one. We only had time for one ad to come out. Yeah, in I remember the dirt, ad. and I took a couple more ads in MBUK and MBI, but they hadn't come out, and all these were on tick, weren't they? They were all like, you didn't have to pay for them yet. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I was thinking like, right, better sell a load of videos and pay for all the advertising, and yeah, it was like, um, luckily we sold. I think it was about three hundred videos. At bike 98 you know and really like i was kind of a bit down i was like oh, i don't know but that was still like three and a half grand or whatever yeah pure profit um or more i can't remember we gave tr who had who stand it was he took a cut and then um you know really like i had people telling me you've done it you know you're doing it it's all right like stick with it you've got something mm. and then um, on the other hand, I had my mum going, oh, I don't know, it's just cult thing, isn't it, really? Oh, you should get a proper job, <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? She kind of, like, worried for me, you know, because yeah. actually I was probably beforehand telling her we were going to sell, like, thousands and stuff like that. Yeah, and really, yeah. like... <laughs> because you look from the outside of the industry, you look at companies, you don't really know how well they're doing. No. You, know, you think, oh, yeah, DMR back then, you know, they're, like, massive. And then when you actually scratch the surface back then, Cow it's shit. kind of, like... Yeah, it's not quite as big as you think, you know, and we used to talk about that a lot and wonder, like, what the hell we were doing, you know. Mm. And then for the second video... How uh, did you, sorry, how did you sell the other 700? So Was that the ad? Um, yeah, so then, like, mail orders sort of kicked in, you know, like, and, and then... That's what we did, yeah, the mail order. Yeah. And then I... I got sprung. Yeah, yeah, so the ads came out in MBUK and MBI... <coughs> And uh, and then and you distributed that all yourself. We sold quite a few like that on my mum's answer phone. Yeah, like people would leave a message. Oh, I'd like to order it, <laughs> you know. And then I'd write it all down, and I still got the book of all the orders in there, no the way. original orders. Yeah, and then um, and then I'd sit upstairs in the office and get on the phone, and I'd go through every single bike shop in MBUK, and I'd say. Uh, hi, Alex from Sprung here. <laughs> you know, just give it a little sh sales pitch and try and like s get them to buy videos. Yeah. Loads of them be like, no, we don't do videos. No, no. And then, so quickly, I sort of started saying, sale or return. I'll just send you the videos. Do you want to try them? Just put them on the counter, see how it goes. And then most of them sold them. Mm. You know, a few that came back. Um, but like the lion's share were like, I'll order some more, you know, like eight, you know, 70% of them were like, yeah. And then some of those turned into like big ones, you know, like single track in Gloucester. They were like buying like 200 videos at a time. And no way. Yeah. It was, it was wild. Cause they, cause then they had their own mail order thing kick in. And yeah. What were you stuff, thinking so. then? Were you, were you thinking this is the right thing to do? Or? Um, I think sprung one. Obviously, 
it was a really short period of time, wasn't it? It's was just a matter of weeks, you know. Yeah. And then we went straight into doing the next one, you know, because it was enough like energy there for us to go into it. And we had a little bit of cash to put fuel in the car. And that's all we needed, really. And then I phoned up. So it was like all about taking it to the next level then, wasn't it? it, was yeah, my, it was oh, and where uh, Sprung One was like really, really, really basic. We went to one regional downhill race at Nantmore Quarry. But we met Steve Pete and he invited us to his house. Do you know what I mean? I remember like seeing him there and you're kind of like, all right, filming him. You know, how's he going to feel about that? Sussing it out. And then he sort of like, when I just went up, asked if I could ask him a few things. He had a broken hip, so he wasn't racing. He was just there watching and I uh, interviewed him. You know, he's just, just like Petey, just lovely. And he's like, oh, you know, come to, come up to mine or whatever and do some filming, you know, because actually there weren't many people filming back then. So, in, especially in the UK like that. So as soon as you sort of shine a camera on people who want coverage, mm. they're going to be like open to it, you know, yeah. really open to it. I remember getting back to the car and Milan comes over to me, he's like, I've got Scott Beaumont's, phone number <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah it's really. phone numbers, you know yeah. it was like wow wow man. i was like really excited and just driving home like this is gonna be amazing <laughs> <laughs> you know? sprung and two then, was a big step up wasn't so, it, so, so sprung two like Did i have was, sponsors too for sprung two yeah i think so yeah yeah and then like not yeah we had ads we had ads yeah right yeah and then there was an ad on sprung one i think as well like psych vibes yeah like oh, yeah, 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 yeah yeah and um yeah, because I went to get content, yeah. So for going back to that original question, Sprung One, there's actually a really good little thing there where I went into a local shop in Exeter just because I was going up and down between Plymouth and home a lot. And I just thought, oh, I was going to check out this shop. I'd seen an ad for it or something. I knew about it. it seemed pretty like underground. I got there and there's Magnus worked there from who owned it. A shop called Psych Vibes. <laughs> pretty cool name. And... Um, he is like an ex BMX dude who's just really into like the new school of mountain biking, like yeah. And he was just a really awesome guy, and um, and he was showing me these photos of this guy called Keith Chegwin in his yeah. like photo album, and he was down at Decoy Trails doing like suicide <laughs> yeah. no handers and yeah. like backflips and some mad stuff like right can one foot one hand uh, cans and yeah. I was just like man, this guy's amazing. Like looks so good, and um. I was like, can we, you know, kind of arrange a little shoot, you know? Um, so, so that went into, that was kind of like, we just started local, you know, yeah. for Sprung One. Yeah. And, they, and we just kept it stuff that was really underground. And it was all on that dirt vibe, you know, because dirt, we were like a couple of issues into dirt, three or four issues of dirt being alive, you know, mm. and that was really informing us. And like, right, this is the direction we're going. And then we were sort of getting vibes from America as well. And, and then, of course, you had the mud cows, like the Kavorak, just sending it off mad launches and just like, that's like mad. Opening wounds in terms yeah, of music. Yeah, and all that. <laughs> and so, you know, and I guess they were kind of pushing like the Johnny Knoxville vibe early yeah, on as well, you know, actually, and we, yeah. were, we were like into all that kind of yeah, you know, edgy Matthew stuff. That was like a, an inspiration. And then you've got all the inspirations. People can like, we can roll out all the inspirations at this point. You know, you've got like the... Crusty Demons of Dirt videos, yeah. Black Flies. Did you have the Black Flies one? It was like similar to Crusty's, and it yeah, was all like uh, like girls in bikinis, like hanging off like electricity pylons in California, <laughs> 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 and they're like all sending like massive senders and just yeah. like you know extreme freestyle, extreme like. And you get back on your mountain bike, you're like, <laughs> 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 and then you had you know the BMX stuff, like you know props, and was yeah. really gaining a lot of momentum. And yeah, props was good actually, wasn't it? Yeah. It was really good, and yeah. and and um, you know the Fox videos with the slow mos and shot on film. And they were big time. Terra Firmas. Yeah, Terra Firmas. Was that what quite out? That wasn't quite out by then. But you had Steel Roots might have I come think, out. I um, think on the well, Moto side. New World Disorder. Oh yeah, Terra Firmas, the Moto one. But yeah. um, you had um, New World Disorder had just dropped. I think yeah. it just come out, and then we were almost getting compared to that. And it's kind of hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite yeah, a yeah. You know, it's like that. You know, because they had, you know, all shot on film. Yeah. It looks amazing, all the locations and then all the thing. But the fact that we were getting compared to that, you know, incredible because we were like shooting on, 
you know, tape, videotape with like these cheap ass cameras, relatively speaking, with just yeah. like local people. And then Sprung 2, really, I wanted to do it, keep it to this video magazine and do it like, right, no, we're going to stop filming and go edit now. But all of a sudden, we're like in the middle of the summer, there's only two of us. Who's going to go and edit it? No one, because we're filming. Like, there's nothing that's going to stop us filming that. Yeah. And Milan was like, let's just make this one as better, you know, make it as best we can. And then we did all that, <clears throat> went to Cheddar, I remember we like literally spat out the master tape the same evening as the Cheddar party at the downhill race. It was like the big end of season national point yeah, yeah, thing yeah. that they had. And uh, we knew that some um, Chile video were promoting Mud Cows 2 and they had a premiere ah. at Cheddar. So the tape spit, spit out the machine, still warm. I drove up. Chili to Cheddar with this master got there <clears throat> just around the time the video was sort of starting maybe there one watched that it was pretty amazing huge crowd everyone was like cheering it was like brilliant film and then I was like oh can we chuck this on you know and then all of a sudden like Mud Cow's just finished and then Sprung 2 started you know no way. and then everyone in there was just like just seeing themselves like the so whole scene yeah, yeah. and they were just like throwing beer just cheering <laughs> like proper like yeah, yeah. made mud cows like look like just a little old lady <laughs> <sort of laughs> <like Yeah. so laughs> compared to i mean mud cows it still went down bloody well but but yeah this was like amazing and milan came up after and just sort of caught the end of it he's like what's going on he's like yeah man they love it you know and it was just so then you know, that was just sort of... You did some travelling in Sprung 2 as well, right? Because we yeah. were watching it and there's a bit in with Petey and at Palmer's house right in the, the 50s. Well, don't get confused because that's like... Actually, Marchy got confused because he thought we did the video diaries, but we didn't. Right. That's The video diaries are called that because they're Steve Pete's video camera, yeah. diaries. That's right. him filming. So that's why they're so intimate. Okay. So like... Palmer's okay. there and he comes right up to the camera, doesn't he? And then he's like riding into yeah. Steve and he's like, mm, mm, mm. Oh, so <laughs> he's like pumping him with the dirt bike, like, and they're just like brothers, you know, like, and that vibe came across, didn't it? And the, yeah, and, oh, the so Steve and, then, yeah and quite often Steve right. would give the camera to someone else because he'd be oh, like, wow. oh, film me do this. And so that's why you can see Steve riding around the house. When was those um, original conversations with Steve then? Because obviously Steve's always been super creative and kind of ahead of his time. Pete, yeah, he so was. He had did a little. Did he come up with that idea? Like, how about I have this? No, no, we knew he had tapes from early on. Right. And then he had the tapes. We <laughs> in Warner had them as well. You know, they both filmed themselves, didn't they? But they just didn't know what to do with them. They didn't know have an outlet. No way. So, and because we kind of came from that media college background we kind of like oh let's segment this out and have these segments and let's have the video diaries or rob's world you know um and break that down so we owe a lot to both of them for raising the profile you know and giving us like made us feel way really legitimate in the scene like in a massive way yeah you know massive way yeah, yeah i suppose in, in terms of like in a timeline you were people really taking us then, people you? taking us seriously you think like yeah. December 97, I decided to make Sprung. And, you know, by um, when was Bike Show? Like March 98, yeah, something yeah. like that. And then by the end of like September, or early October 98, we had Sprung 2 already. Yeah. So in less than a year, we were like part of the mountain bike scene. Like we could call up anyone in the UK. Do you feel a responsibility? As far as like, cause from no. my, you were no, but you were like carving <laughs> Don't out. Don't the questions. Hey, hey, no, yeah. you were like carving out what was cool. Like you looked at that, you looked at dirt, and you looked at sprung. And like right, that's the direction. Like you said, it gave you an identity. It gave you like the music to listen to. Gave you the clothes yeah. to wear. Were you like aware that was happening? Um, music, you must have been, dude. You must have been. No, we just wanted to make the next video better. Each one wanted to make it better. That's all we cared about. And then, in terms of like comparing ourselves like a lot of people you could answer that self do you think you're better than other videos or whatever mm. it's always like a comparing which that question was really well worded <laughs> but um it uh 
we never we just find be different yeah like so every single mountain bike video always had like metal you know and a lot it was like 99 percent metal mm. you know because that's what they thought mountain bikers wanted yeah we didn't care what people wanted yeah. <laughs> like you with scrub we kind of like wanted that vibe but also in the caveat that we needed to get the music for free yeah so <laughs> we couldn't we didn't just go yeah, out okay, and use so so like all the I used to be indie sort of all the yeah so all the music on sprung was legit you know we just spent hours like phoning around like music contacts wow. and like getting people we knew to help us do that so and like just calling in favor after favor and yeah and that didn't really stop until sprung five we were just like always just favor after favor to try and get like whatever we could mm. and of course we were following or i was following what we knew and what we liked you know which is kind of where we were pulling all these things in that were kind of mm. cool but yeah. they still weren't like the pinnacle of what we were listening to right but it was sort of like had that vibe you know yeah. and then like so you know there's stuff got through that we don't sit around and listen to you know what i mean but it was good for sprung it, yeah, it was kind of like so um yeah i mean okay. it was it was a struggle that's for sure and like Sprung three, we've still sleeping on floors, you know. And like after sprung two, we sold like a thousand, and I printed another thousand for the next bike show, ninety nine. And um, uh, you know, it wasn't like we were selling thousands and thousands of videos, really. You know what I mean? We were just like I had enough to order another print run. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? So that was two thousand videos we sold at sprung two initially and um, went to bike 99 i had a, a deal with a, one of our favorite customers who gave us like nine quid a video or something like that or, or it might have been a bit more you know and we sold quite a lot of sprung two at bike 99 i remember going back like how many you sold he's like go and get another box you know go and get some more boxes i'm like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we spent all that money going to la um right. with p right. so you know for sprung in, three yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like just constantly reinvesting. And then because I was like 23, I just loved it because I was just getting to travel. Yeah. You know, 22, 23, I was just like, that's all that motivated me, going to the next thing and going to that. You know, so Sprung 2, we did go. I, I remember phoning up Animal and saying, oh, have you got, I'm doing this thing. Have you got any opportunities? And the guy there, he's like, yeah, you can, if you get down to Andover, you can jump in the bus with the team and go to Switzerland and Czech Republic for two weeks. I'm like, okay. Phoned up Milan, I said, right, get there. And we literally just had whatever petrol we had in the car, <laughs> got to the weather, because we, we had no money, you know, and yeah. we got to the animal truck, and we were in it, you know, we were like in this thing that we'd seen in the magazines with like Tim Ponting, Robin Kitchen, <laughs> Andy Bostock, and we're like, yeah, this is fine, you know, let's just, roll with this and then like the next day we were snowboarding on a glacier in <laughs> switzerland <laughs> milan turns around to me on the chair on the lift up you know on the button lift just before i fell off the button lift because i'd never snowboarded before he's like this cost us two pound fifty so that's all we'd spend on food to that to that point you know and i like laughed and fell off the lift and he went off <laughs> and uh, i think it took me like half an hour to actually get to the top of the mountain and I finally got to the top. <laughs> I read about 10 metres and winded myself at 3,000 metres. <laughs> can breathe at the top of the thing. I'm, like, I'm not sure about snowboarding. <laughs> and my land's like, get your camera, we're going filming. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was all funny little adventures like that from one thing to the next, you know. And then he couldn't go to Czech Republic because he was, didn't have a visa because he's from Ser Serbia. So I ended up on my own in Czech Republic filming that european championships and i met people like steve jones right. yeah, yeah, in yeah. the bar you know after and i remember being like in the strip club or whatever in the nightclub with rob warner being a mischievous little bugger and ends up like everyone this big fight kicks off <laughs> <laughs> and, like, i'm in like face to face with a bouncer 
bouncers just to punch Sarah Jorgensen in the face. I'm like, you can't punch a girl, mate. And he's like, oh, I'll punch you instead, though. <laughs> I remember getting, like, punched in the head. Oh, no. And I had, like, this VX9000 back in my backpack, in my animal backpack, my brand new animal backpack. <laughs> I stuffed, like, this massive camera in the backpack. And I'm like turn my back on the bouncer and he's like punching my camera i'm like don't punch the camera <laughs> and like turn around so i could take the punch on my face instead of punching the camera and then i run out through because i was in the nightclub bit which was connected to the strip club and i ran through the strip club over the podium where the dancers were in the video like all right love like that this girl just like half naked and like all the Irish were in there watching, enjoying the show. And then all of a sudden I come through, <laughs> backpack on over the podium. And they're all just like, yeah, like, like, that's all I could hear. Like this huge cheer, of these bouncers chasing me. And they didn't make it out of the club, the bouncers. They all got bounced on by the Irish. No. <laughs> huge shout. And then I'm just like outside going, Oh my god, oh my god. Like, out. People out there just enjoying their evening, like, you're all right. I'm like, oh, it's a massive fight, a massive fight. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I, know, I think I'm going back. Like, I remember just walking back by myself to where we were staying. And then the next day at breakfast, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> the police came, <laughs> shots were fired. No like, like, I remember Jason Carpenter telling me he said he was running from the police. <laughs> I think he was shooting at him and he was running like that. What was he exactly? <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> he's he's, he's like, watched a you? tutorial. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine wow. hearing that? Like, you know, after, <laughs> the sorry. camera made it though. Camera seemed to be a microphone with a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, audio still worked. <laughs> All right. And, um, that sprung through. <coughs> that, was still sprung on two. that was that sprung two. <laughs> that was sprung two. That was sprung two. That one. And then, um, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so uh, I can't remember what else was in sprung two. That was sort of like it ended with Petey's house, didn't it? His like, yeah. there's a session with him. Yeah. That's still a favourite. That had like yeah. a tune from a, a guy that lived in the village where yeah. I lived. And it was a band called the Swindonians, and he was. Uh, I used to work with his dad at the local garage. <clears throat> where I used to clean cars and his dad was in the parts department and his son um, was in this band called the Swindonians with Julian Sanger and he wrote the song himself and he got it played on John Peel and stuff and wow. uh, yeah. you're probably helping the music industry too but it's hard to track isn't it oh, I think like yeah. now you could see streams you feel like okay like yeah. what, what Danny Mac did for um 100 percent yeah, 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 yeah the name of that band mm. band of horses yeah, 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 yeah. like so they yeah. saw that it's not they nothing. Like, oh my god yeah. like it, it's blown but yeah no one i think we had like a few things like came back to us in the long term and yeah i think we had like a smooth smooth um i got that album yeah he's still Come going on. and like he was like on instagram the other day like people were tagging him in it and he's like oh yeah i remember this and wow so not being played i thought oh, i was like because you got them before they blew up yeah and then they blew up and like i was like i always used to yeah. think this must it must have had some impact because it was like everyone i knew mm. was wearing out their vhs and buying mark being played yeah, music so. and i was just like I, it couldn't have not had an impact yeah yeah like village biking people yeah, <laughs> like blowing up this <laughs> hip hop artist, but still, that's do you ever meet him? Do you, are you friends with Never him? Never met him. No, I spoke to him on the phone, and yeah, it was like, just like, yeah, whatever, mate. No, I like do. BMX. I'm like, yeah, he's kind of like BMX. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got BMX in there. <laughs> Tighter clothes, uh, brighter colours. <laughs> I played, <laughs> I played that one a couple of times, just like with people, sort of like, because mountain biking just wasn't cool, you know, yeah. compared to. Why not? Do you think? Well, it was sort of like you had X Games, didn't you? And it was kind of like they had skate, BMX, and mountain biking seemed so far off the radar at that yeah. point. Mm. And it was always my dream that it would get like built up profile where it would be sort of more like that. And it is now massively, isn't it? So, mm. um, I think it helped a lot having uh, having the, you know, like I think that's what I think is important. Is is it's like. People would have been riding dirt jumps, riding trails, doing cool stuff. But until you put it in Dirt Magazine on Sprung Video, I mean, it's sort of the whole a tree falls in the forest with no one around, does it make a sound? Yeah. Mount, mountain biking wouldn't be cool unless you had these avenues. I think I asked you earlier about like what your influences are, but I think like actually it's super important. I don't know what, 
I don't know whether we have these like channels anymore where cool stuff it's hard to say it without it sounding like elite or like annoying but but dirt really helped me know what is cool and there were riders that that were good but didn't make it into dirt and that Mm. were good that didn't make Mm. it into Mm. videos i think like part of being cool is like um also sort of not trying too hard you know we used to like there's a couple of things going on there like I didn't spend sort of five years at uni just being obsessed with bikes. I was obsessed with, with music culture. Yeah. Going out and being a young person. And then like riding was something we just did and, and digested like the magazines. I wasn't like 100% ride bikes by bikes. Yeah. I was like all other stuff, you know, and that's what influenced Sprung. And yeah. the same with Milan and his whole life of experience went into Sprung. And we both happened to have similar interests. And then when it came to picking the riders to feature, I remember going to like the ra- the UK races. I'm, I dragged Milan to every single national in 1998. And we were like, we're going to do the whole season. And we met everyone, right? Yeah. You know, we knew all the riders and we really got into the scene there. Mm. And then we are like, right, who are we going to go and film? And you had ov- the obvious things like the Shropshire scene, isn't it? Which is like a real standout section on... Uh, sprung two, it's like the opening yeah. sections. Yeah. That was like the core of the UK scene was the Shropshire guys. You know, um, Stu Hughes, shout out to Stu days. Hughes, Jim Buchanan, Cunny, mm. and then you had like Matt Farmer, you know, and you could say Matt Farmer wasn't cool. I don't know if you remember him, but he was like, he Lycra. rode f- he rode for Rally and he wore full Lycra, which was kind of like day glow. And it was kind of like, he wasn't like an obvious choice yeah. for getting chucked in t- something that you would think like was cool but for us he was like a must you know he was like really cool to us you know what i mean in a way that because he was different you know yeah and that's what made him cool because he's different he's not trying to follow the crowd and you could say like extrapolate that out to like when i look at like hordes of bmx's from the era that i was making bmx films everyone just wore black yeah. you know what i mean everyone's just the same you know, I remember my wife coming with me to Cologne World Champs. She's like, everyone's so samey, aren't they? They're just like, you're like yeah, they're all, you know, and mm. the people that would stand out and you'd want to sort of feature are the ones that were more unusual and and um, have a bit more of uh, their own their own um, personality yeah. that you Authentic. could see. You could, would, you know, in skating, everyone is full of it's all about being different isn't it and not just following the crowd whereas bmx seemed to, to me to be behind that at the right. time you know yeah. everyone's actually really insecure because <laughs> yeah. they don't want to stand out you it know was it be first different started popping in that scene like where there's a little bit more not this out I, i'm just thinking if i remember watching videos it'd be like nate was it nate wessel, wessel? wessel? yeah like just long dreads he was just like himself and yeah different right yeah, yeah, to a yeah. Lot, of the, lot of other ones but I, you're right though it was very i like, think like in the uk scene it was sort of there's less individuality in, in America. It's different, like because we used to get a lot of heat from the UK BMX scene about being like mountain bike mm. people, you know, yeah, like because it wasn't cool, yeah. Because yeah. I think there was like a a little devil video, and in one of the little devil, this is going back to like 1997 or something like that. It was like probably the coolest like BMX video at the time. And it happened to have like a mountain biker getting punched in the video. And that's it. <laughs> you know, everyone's like, we push so mountain bikers now. Everyone, yeah, man, everyone, I've paid for that one for a while, yeah. I think it was just some guy that turned up at the trails and yeah. he was moaning about the trails in the woods and he happened to be, having, be on a mountain bike. He yeah. wasn't a mountain biker yeah, trying to yeah. ride the trails. He was just some local old geezer who was just moaning about the, bun- you know, yeah, the trail. Yeah, yeah. And I think he got punched in the video. And then <laughs> this is me like condensing it down to like the minutia of why a lot of BMX, UK BMX kiddies had attitude about mountain bikes. But if I've, you can't ignore the fact that mountain biking was full of kooks, you know, and it was really kooky. Yeah. And if you were like on this cool like street BMXer or, mm. or whatever, there was plenty to moan about like British mountain biking, you know, scene. It was really kooky. Mm. And so we did a, we w- did everything we could to try and include the BMXs in Sprung 
at every level while showing like what mountain bikers could be or should be or you know and at the time it was just slowly getting better and better and um yeah i think we did it in the end you know by yeah. sprung five we had rampage and and then i remember like Stephen murray who was also in sprung five coming up to me afterwards he'd seen the rampage bit and he's like oh my god these mountain bikers are so legit you know and he yeah. was like really really buzzing for for mountain biking and hyped and like taking it really really seriously but then on the flip side you know we were there sprung three with pt at sheep hills riding with cory nastasio brian foster yeah and all the bmx ki kiddies out there who thought it was rad that they were mountain bikers getting through the trails yeah. if you turned up at the mountain bike trails in the uk with mountain bikes you'd be like you know yeah, you'd be getting well, pretty yeah. salty and so was there a point the during thing. this like the sprung era where you had that like it's working this is it we're on to something like is there is there a sprung point? three really yeah then maybe we could talk about that after the break after the break oh, <laughs> dude, <laughs> you are. I to get honestly <laughs> Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every single day. Same. I drink it literally every day as well. And I have since they've become a sponsor of the podcast. Yeah, man. And some say... And a bit before. Yeah, a little bit before as well. We did a little bit of a test, didn't we? Yeah. Some people have said that the podcast wouldn't be what it is without us being optimised, nutritionally sound, and just generally feeling better. Dude, but absolutely. I think that's probably true. I tell you the biggest thing for me. Mm -hmm. I used to have all of these little pots and little boxes and powders and all of these different little vitamins and minerals and stuff yeah, yeah, and yeah. supplements. Yeah, I would take and it would take me ages to get them all out of their little twisty, twisty bottles and their pipettes <laughs> and their little tiny things. Like oh my in goodness! The kitchen. And every day I had to do that. Yeah, it's too much, man. Dude, it's too much. Now I get up. I have my AG1. Super easy as well, isn't it? Whether you're it, using a scoop out of the tin or you're using a travel pack, shall I do a quick AG1 just to show you how dude, easy it is? Show how easy it is I'll to show cover you how easy all it is. your nutritional bases, dude. Okay. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> this is when it starts getting really good for audio listeners, isn't it? Because Yeah, really good for audio okay, listeners. Okay, shall I explain what you're doing? Yes, please. Davey's just taken one of the travel packs, That's which correct. we'll get more onto later on. He's tipping it actually not into, even into his shaker. He's just doing it into a glass because he doesn't even have his shaker with him because he used it at home this morning. So he's now, right, oh. he's just, okay. Uh, 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 this is a remix, dude. <laughs> this is a remix. Okay. So, can on. you explain the remix? Yeah, okay. Some people choose to use water. Tap water is absolutely fine. Just yeah. some of that. We've got some of that. You yeah. know, you can pour, pour a little bit of water in there like this. Yeah, okay. He's there pouring the water. Yeah, he's pouring What I water. like to do though, Ollie, is okay. I like to use coconut water uh, 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 it's ever so tasty move. and it's even better if it has a yellow sticker on it there you go so yeah so i'm gonna put some coconut water into this right i'm gonna go through some facts whilst you're mixing that up ag1 replaces your multivitamin probiotic and more in one single simple drinkable habit science driven formulation of vitamins probiotics and whole food source nutrients ag1 is raising the standard for quality in the supplement category it helps you build your health foundation first. And you probably can hear Davey stirring that up right now. Yeah, it's stirred, mate. It's ready to go. And that's it. It's as simple as that, dude. You literally put your packet in or your scoop, a little bit of water or coconut water if you choose to, and then you know you're going to be nutritionally sound throughout the day. Okay, I'm just going to have a quick swig. Have a swig. All right. Mm. Can you hear him? He's enjoying it. In case you're not watching, he is enjoying it. Um, covering his nutritional basis for the day literally couldn't be easier, which is why Davy trusts AG1. Isn't that right? <laughs> That's correct, dude. So if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D or vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Pretty good. Go to drinkag1.com slash ride companion. That is drink ag1.com forward slash ride companion okay that's drink ag1.com forward slash ride companion and right there you will find out how to get your free travel packs free vitamin d delivered to your door nutritionally sound ready to be optimized ready to kick ass in the world it's as easy as that all the details are in the show description so what are you waiting for support the podcast and get involved all right thanks ag1 thanks ag1 
It's funny to think of your life as chapters of, of like these videos. It is, though, it? isn't it? It is, though. For yeah. me, it is, because it's just how I remember things as well. You know, like, I break it down in that. Mm. Cool as that. Mm. So what was the change from Sprung, then? You've got, we've, we got to Sprung 3, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Oh, yeah, what was the thing? We could, we could probably brush over, because three, from 3 to 5, it was kind of like we were kind of going through the motions a, a bit more. It just certain things happened, like we got the big distributor. Was for chili? Chili video, yeah. yeah. So we resisted for 2, because they, they wanted it. And then, um, yeah, we give it them. You know, we held off and we get... We had a mad, amazing deal. We had such a good deal. And I made them do like a sliding pay scale on the royalties. So if they sold more, I was like, okay, yeah, we'll give us a bit less then, as long as you sell more. <laughs> you know, and if they sold direct, then we'd get like a big chunk of that right. direct sale. And it worked. Sorry, did they handle mail order? Yeah, they Obviously, handled mail order. And they did like... Alfred's. That's where I remember going to Alfred's was, every week. That was like the biggest thing for us. Video was, thing. And the most satisfying thing for me as someone out of uni who, who'd set out to sort of try and make a mark on the mountain bike scene. Try and we, sp we both started Sprung to try and help us get a job. Do you know what I mean? We had no other expectations than that yeah. really. We thought, well, if the worst case we get a job out of it, brilliant. You know what I mean? And then it turns out we kind of did actually sell them worldwide. We did actually make quite yeah. a, like a little bit of cash from it and then um um the biggest satis most satisfying thing for me was was by far and away was being able to go around plymouth or whatever i when I used to go down and visit milan <coughs> and uh going to virgin megastore hmv smiths cool stuff, that, it? Yeah. and see your product on the shelf with everything yeah. else it was like oh mate that was just such a like so so cool you know if you had instagram now you're like ah, check me out yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? it would have been like you know just such a buzz it was so exciting and and um you know even to go in virgin megastore and then to see their own sticker on the front of your one and their own like barcode thing or yeah or, you know, i remember that after a while there was like one in the sale bin i'm like Oh, it's in the sale, bit. Yeah. <laughs> Take it out. It was so like, really exciting, you know, just these, like, I don't care it's on sale. Brilliant, you know, like, someone's so going to buy cool, it. Man. And then, yeah, then Halford sold them for years, you yeah. know, like. In That's how I remember doing Duke, it. Duke video, Duke that video, was, yeah. they were, like, teamed up with Duke, and they kind of rebranded Duke Chili to make it sound less sort of, like, um, Lombard Rally and more, like, hip, like mountain bike -y. So um yeah. and more, like, skate and stuff and they had an office in london and we used to love going there because ssm free sports stuart sawyer and um sandy stevenson and stuart started his media company off the back of windsurfing in the 80s he used to do media from windsurfing and then he built like this sort of um you know and then he they did chain spotting yeah. and um oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah tricks yeah. and stunts and all that so they did all those and then they did they did uh a few other things and they used to give us work you know so that was really great for us yeah so <clears throat> over time i did like editing for them we used to go to london and work in london do editing and, and do um like they had a motocross video that the director walked out walked out on and i did a bit of filming and got milan to do some filming and i re-edited it and stuff right. like that and i didn't um i didn't advertise it because i didn't do the whole thing but it was kind of you know brilliant for me because it was like real cash cool. Not i don't want to say i don't know it might have been <laughs> okay right yeah. yeah heaven and something on earth yeah yeah yeah, heaven, yeah. yeah. And they, they did a <laughs> they went to do a sequel they went to do a sequel and they put me on a little re they gave me an advance yeah and i went to eastern it's europe american one. Oh, the traveling one mm, i went to eastern europe <laughs> to do one I did one filming shoot for it and then went on a ski holiday and then they went bankrupt right. and I kept the <laughs> yeah. I kept the the advance they given me which wasn't that much really and um uh but yeah a lot of people have lost out on that but luckily no, really. the sprung thing had kind of like fizzled out by then and I was <clears throat> looking for something else to do mm around the same time as that year in between sprung and earth so why did you stop why did sprung start so sprung's like a big thing i just spoke about it for the first time ever with um an interview i did for shredder i sort of like never really sort of went into it that much but um sprung kind of 
sprung three, we made good money because we had that deal. Yeah. And I think we kind of found our level of the amount of videos we sold. Right. Sp sprung four, things were changing at Chile. And it went from me dealing with Sandy and people who wanted to sell it to like accountants. Like it changed really quickly to like, oh, well, if you want us to be your distributor, you have to do it at this price. I'm like, yeah. that's rubbish. We don't want to do that. We don't, can't do that. And then part of me felt like we were never going to sell that many more videos, you know? Mm. And I knew Sprung 4 was was good, but it wasn't that same jump up from 2 to 3 was like big jump up. You know, 3 to 4, 4 was, you know, about the same. You know, we went to New York, we had the different yeah. things, you know, we had the, the, the road trip with the Mark B and Blade music yeah. and stuff, but it didn't feel like we were going to sell like twice as many as Sprung 3, you know what I mean? So the deal was there, I just thought, we can't really do it ourselves now. You know, it's hard to go back to what we were doing. Part of me, in hindsight, thought I should have said, no, sod you. I'm just going to go and do it myself again and yeah. just see what happens. Yeah. You know, we might have been better. Yeah. But at the same time, I was thinking about Sprung 5. I need to go and get that in the can and do this and do that. And then after three, after three, Milan moved to America. He moved to California. So, like I said at the start, that was kind of his plan. Uh, he never really sort of said that to me, but yeah. um, he ended up doing it. It was, like, amazing. Like, he had this goal to get there, and he, he pulled it off. You know what I mean? He's amazing. And um, for Sprung 4, he came back, and we edited it in the UK. Um, and he was here for, like, a month. And when he went, Sprung 4 was done. You know what I mean? And then, and that was in time for Christmas and all this stuff. So that was like the real key thing for Sprung was to get it out. So yeah. we had like and people's stockings, you know. Mm. Um, and then sounded like Santa Claus, don't I know. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> for five, I went to America. So I spent 2001 filming all around Europe on my own because he was in America. Yeah. And then he did a bit of filming over there. He went to a couple of races and then he was working for Fox Sports Network in America. Right doing like stuff for their sort of TV channel. And then he was repurposing the footage. He, we could repurpose some of it and put it in Sprung, right. you know, so you see that influence in Sprung 5. It's almost like two separate films. You've almost got like Earthed 1, Nick meeting Sprung, Ultra Sprung, where it was like really lovely shooting, all cinematic style, and then yeah. my rough shit coming in, all like BMX style and like... Um, and then like the gritty stuff coming through and then mix it all together and we had like the Sprung 5, which is incredible. Like product was amazing, right? Yeah. And then, um, but we, it was the first one we edited ourselves, like on Final Cut Pro. All right. the others we'd used, we'd had to use facilities. Yeah. Right. So Sprung 4, we kind of did half at this college non-linear edit suite where we could get in for free, like a Sony one. And then we did, like we got, oh, a, we got that. a week in at this other professional facility where we could still use the uh, Avid. And we were like, right, well, we've got this pre-edited. Let's drop this in here. And then we've got it. You know, we spent a month doing that and two weeks in the professional edit suite with like two weeks in the Sony edit suite, which we would get for free. Mm. It was still a really good edit suite, but it wasn't as expensive as the Avid. So <clears throat> I did question why know, it came back from America. I was thinking... Just jump on a Zoom call, <laughs> yeah. do a section each. I, I, I'd completely forgotten that at this stage you're still in editing suites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, so so for five, I went to stay with Milan in yeah. Palm Springs, and stayed there for I was there for three months, like the full amount of time you're allowed to be there. Aren't you? I was supposed to be there for two months, have the video done, and then come home. Mm. And then we. I went out there and we were kind of real lackadaisical about, we weren't like, right, let's edit this. We had like the whole of September. It was just after 9-11, I went out there. I remember Milan picking me up from the airport. It was like mad security. And it was just like a really different vibe. But um, yeah, we went there and just sort of like, mm, let's go to the skate park then, you know? <laughs> and then we did, but we did stuff like the Carl Strait filming. Yeah. And we went to that. Rampage. Yeah. You know, that was then, when I was there. Hell, that section was amazing. Because so, we didn't see that other than on your... Mm, 
like where where would you see Rampage? You wouldn't see it, would you? You'd see not like really. No. Stills in like not a really. magazine. Yeah. Being not in the UK, you would just wouldn't. True. Yeah, not really. I mean, True. you'd have to wait for New Odd Sorted to come out. Yeah. And yeah. that would have been a little bit of a wait, wouldn't it? So, I mean, that was a that was a cool experience and it was good timing, you know. Uh, and it was weird looking back at like Carl Strait just being like fourteen and a half, yeah. whatever he is in the video, and now you see him. Just like Stick. at the end of his career, and I was put, put things in perspective for me personally, and also Zinc was. I think he wasn't when we did Sprung Five. He wasn't around, but he was with Kyle when we met up with him for. Really? Oh, he was because he we went to these big trails. I remember these huge trails that Kyle couldn't remember where they were. And we were like driving around for hours looking at <laughs> these trails, and he was just giggling like this little kid. Like I'm like Kyle really need to find these trails where I'd like, can you phone anyone or find out? He's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. He's just like, <laughs> hilar- not funny for us because we were like, <laughs> we really want to go and find this place. And we got there and they were insane were, well, f- compared to what we'd seen before. I'm like, you're just a kid. You're not going to ride those. Are you? This is... <laughs> And then they were just trail, trail boss in them, you know, just right. full trail boss. Him and and Zink was there. And then Zink was like, you know, up and like, look, you know, he was just like, who's this kid? And he's like, oh, yeah, my, you know, now it's it's mad to see how, to think, how it? it all has all gone on. It's awesome, you know. Like, I wanted really. the backpack Carl Strait had. I can't tell you how much yeah, I wanted the backpack. backpack it was a run, spy yeah. backpack. Oh, I wanted wow. it so badly. A spy, it? It was a spy, spy yeah. 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 I wanted yeah. it. And all of my friends did. We were all just like, how yeah. do you get it? Because you couldn't, like, how do you get it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, man, I remember wanting it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> spy back <like> that. <laughs> Weird how those little things stick with you. Yeah. Just those little things. Yeah. Not even it is funny, yeah. Part of the film properly, but. Yeah. You just. Totally. <laughs> I need yeah. it. I yeah. don't want yeah. that thing. It's mad, isn't it? I was like, it with black fly sunglasses. I was just like, oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, sunglasses. Yeah. <laughs> Can't but, get them. But I remember. Uh, like talking about influences then as well like I guess we were still like I remember Milan saying oh you got to check this out and it was on any Sunday yeah you know so wow. and that really informed Sprung 5 like big time and then we went to Lake, Lake Elsinore yeah. f- we filmed at Lake, Lake Elsinore yeah which was in on any Sunday yeah. where they, S- they Cessna was in Cess she did some stuff um, wasn't she in on any Sunday as one of the kids Am I making that? Oh up? wow! I yeah, that. yeah, I think she was. Yeah, she yeah, was. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing film. If yeah. people haven't seen it, they're watching. Yeah. This. yeah. So, so then you had like we sprung five. You had Milan had like the snow sprung bit yeah. at the end. Can you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I so because that was a good example of what he was doing for um, Fox Sports Network. Right. So then he, he that was like for a segment for Fox Sports Network where they had like yeah. interviews and it was like you know what I mean, and then he just like repurpose it for sprung. Mm. So that's kind of what a lot of sprung was in there, you know, and it worked. I think it was it was good, but it was just different. And um, things were things were difficult because I was there for the whole three months. I and I, I left with no money at all. I spent all my money, like every single last penny. I I was previously I'd moved out of home, and after that I had to move back into home, my mum's house, you know, and that's kind of like a bit of a sort of downer. And then it was clear at that point then, right, even if Sprung sold loads, it was going to be difficult for me to move out. Yeah. Again, you know, it's like something had to change anyway. I mean, something had to, and and really to keep going with Sprung just wasn't feasible. And I think Milan kind of felt the same, that it probably wasn't worth the headaches. Where did the the majority of the revenue come from at that point? Would it come from sales or from sponsorship? Um. It was like a mix, but the the sponsorship wasn't easy. Yeah. Like we have got twenty four seven. We had it was good for UK sponsors. Yeah, you know, um, but for Sprung Five, I really wanted to get it so we were more like American. We could get into that American vibe because I knew like New World Disorders were getting like ten k, ten thousand dollars per sponsor. Yeah, and we weren't getting nothing. We get like some free. Free T-shirt, keyring maybe, chuck a keyring. We in. get, but well, that's what it, that's what it was boiling down to was yeah. like Spy were on, um, Sprung Five, and you think, oh yeah, brilliant sponsor, amazing, we made them look amazing. And what do we get? We got like ten pairs of sunglasses. 
You know what I mean? What did yeah. you get for the Atom? And like a few pair of glasses. I got like um, some pedals and some wheels. Did you? Yeah. The 24-7 hey, one was you know? a few, the cartoon. With so the two guys. good, that was. was Jamie, it's Jamie. Stop yeah. frame or whatever. So, so they, they were really good, you know. Guy yeah. Guy. And well, like, you know, we had really like Sprung Free was probably the pinnacle, you know, Sprung Free and Four in terms of that. And I think, I don't know what was happening around the time in the UK with this with the scene but maybe things were just on a bit of a dip and we just couldn't quite raise the funds for five mm. the same way you know we couldn't go back to DMR and 24-7 and kind of fizzling a bit they weren't yeah you know they'd hadn't seen there so I think around that time it was kind of like entering like a bit of a phase where something so yeah because like we had we had orange we had royal yeah. and it was all just pro it was all product, man. It was all like yeah. rubbish, you know. And like, really, we should have been like, yeah, look, we've done three, we've done four. You should be paying this much, and it just wasn't happening. Yeah. So, so, you know, maybe if I'd have done a better job at like putting my foot down and saying, but I just don't think the vibe was there. And it's a bit way harder at the time. Well, yeah. Like, yeah. Now you send an email out with the pitch deck, and it's like, how would you have done it then? Literally yeah. going to the office. I was on the phones. Yeah. You know, I was on the phones and. And chatting, and then we had relationships with mm. a lot of people in the industry because we were at the races a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, you think five, we were still sleeping on floors, so it wasn't like it is now, where people were getting paid like to be freelance filmers, and and the industry could support like all these different characters. It just wasn't. And um, uh, you know, you were lucky to have what you had. You know, yeah. and um. With with five, it kind of it re wheels came off a bit with distribution stuff. Like ultimately, um, I didn't really see much money from the American DVD because Milan kind of every single deal we'd done before was fifty fifty, where we'd invoice separately every single royalties, we'd invoice separately, mm. and then I'd say you've got to you've got to tell them you've got to send the report out to Milan and me, and we both invoice separately like that. And then, because Milan was in LA, he popped down to do the DVD for, the, and there was it happened to be the American distributor there. And then they did their own release, totally off their own back. And I'm like, oh my god, like how has that happened? You know what I mean? It was like, so Milan had kind of taken control of it, right. and, and I'd lost that. You know, I was sort of left out, if you like. So it was kind of. For me, that was the end of Sprung. Do you know so what I mean? At that point, he, hadn't talked to you about he kind of like, he didn't say, oh no, you've got to send your invoice now to, to these people or you can right. invoice me, you know. Yeah. He was kind of like, he sort of took over and that was kind of, yeah, that's pretty weird. he wasn't actually very good at the admin. He'd admit that now. He, he actually told me that, um, you know, he fucked up. So, mm. um, uh, I don't really like to go on about it, but it's not that upsetting for me now. No, <laughs> you know, it is fine. It's and right yeah. Part, yeah. And and then uh, yeah, and then that brings us right up to Earth, really, and just like how, I, how like where I'm talking about lucky to have a job, happy to have whatever you've got going on. You know, I spent then I spent the next year just hustling, just trying to make something happen, and you know I was just filming whatever i could i happened to i really loved bmx at the time yeah and i was going to do a video with uh, two and eight guys yeah and and um and so yeah yeah and i was gonna so i was sort of just sort of jumping in vans with them on one road trip i did and um why so sprung <coughs> we're at the end of the sprung chapter mm, almost yeah, right? yeah it yeah. hasn't it's been a, it's been a success in some ways but not in others maybe mm. not in financial success mm. But like, why do you? Why did you really want to carry on down that road of like making more bike films? Like that's just what I did. You know, that's, that's it. Yeah, just like there's no. You're gonna make it work. Yeah, there's yeah, no so. way I was gonna. Uh, I'm not interested in anything no. else at all. Not you doing freelance work as well though to like pay only, the bills. Only, like pay the bills or only anything. if something came up. Yeah. yeah, but I wasn't pitching myself to like TV people or anything like that. I mean, you got to bear in mind I did the whole thing on like, like uh, I bought a camera. Like the VX nine thousand kept me going until sprung four. Yeah. And then it wow. kind of went a bit funny, and um, I went to Western Beach race, and it rotted out. Like all the salt, don't ever <laughs> take a camera 
that records the tape, the Western Bee Trace. What a bike. It will die. I don't take anything, man. <laughs> it's <laughs> just silly. And, um, I bought this um, 1500 quid was my next camera. Do you know what I mean? It's not like it is now where people are like spending fortunes to do the films and yeah. stuff. So I spent 1500 quid on a Sony PD-100. It's a D <coughs> DV cam, small sensor. And I did like most of Sprung 5 on that. And then earth one and two was like like 99 percent on this like idiot guy here would have thought you'd have to film on something different because we, we've gone through the change from vhs to dvd but you, it's the same no 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 it's the same because the dvd just gets yeah. earth made. was the first thing that i bought on both oh yeah yeah I yeah buying anyway. earth on video and then seeing it on dvd and being like it's gonna be way better. Yeah, the yeah. extras as well. I'm, I think there was sprung five point one. I'm thinking of. Yeah, right. so cool though. You had like the five menu point. or like. Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. menu it opened was up so <laughs> much. <shit. laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, we've we've earthed, um I uh, I was scratching around for a year. You know, I went to Caprun. I worked for Orange a little bit. You know, and that wasn't really gonna sort of pay for much <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it just wasn't you know yeah. they PT. they thought you know I could go away for two weeks and get paid like you know a grand or less you know yeah it's mad you know it's like when I think back I agreed a price and I'm like oh actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I was just happy I was just happy you know just getting about and yeah. um uh yeah just still in the scene still like doing that thing and um early in in 2002 i got word that 4 and 30 were looking for someone maybe what wanted to speak to me about maybe sort of going yeah. that route you know and it was tim march the advertising guy there who just got his job there in the ear of mark noble the owner and chris saying telling them they should get someone like me to sort of do their films because they had a BMX guy before. Yeah. And um, doing the films. So um, 4130, oh, then what What titles did it include and what sports? So, so 4130, they, they published Ride BMX magazine, which was their like bread and butter, you know, the thing they did, like the biggest. They sold like most of those. And then they started Dirt magazine. And then put me on the spot. I don't know what oh, they did. Is at the time, it? at the time, they did Document Skateboard Magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think that was... Not Kingpin. Oh, then they had a level, which was Chris's Lifestyle Magazine. Right. They, they didn't have a Moto one. Moto came a few years after. Okay. Mm, right. So, and that was obviously like a really good fit for me. And I did end up doing yeah. those in motocross, for sure. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, it was mainly the, the BMX and the in the skate stuff because i was oh sorry in the mountain bikes obviously and i was really 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 into bmx at the time and um so that was something i could just do and get out of my system if you like yeah and i spent yeah. like the winters i did two videos for them uh no, um, no front teeth was the second one cassette was the first cassette, one yes cassette I and uh, cassette, yeah and yeah, those, so I think No Front Teeth sort of like people still sort of chat about now. Like, I sometimes still, when I go out digging and it's raining, mm -hmm. I have the music from the James Brooks section of him stacking up <laughs> Chertsey. I, I promise yeah. you, I do. I'm on my own in the woods, yeah. and I have the music. It's like a percussive, like jazz thing. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. I just think, yeah. <laughs> that was left over from Sprung Five. That yeah. mate, how weird is that? That's like that is what in influence it sort of has it's like things that you don't even think about like i haven't even thought about it until then yeah like those videos meant a lot like uh growing up for sure mm. yeah so much so so much so i think with with what i was doing i had a salary for the first time ever right that's what 4130 brought you know and that meant i could move out yeah properly move out do you know what i mean and i had they bought me a computer, like a big MacBook Tower thing, mm. two massive monitors for editing at home, and yeah, and it was just amazing. Wow. And 
like an actual tape deck that I could take from the camera and put my tapes in so I didn't have to use a camera. And it was just, it was just a brilliant feeling, you know. Mm. It wasn't like a salary that, you know, it was the end goal. It was just, yeah, 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 it was yeah. just... Um, a bit of comfort almost. Oh, like take the pressure it was, off it was just like confirmation and then I put everything into it. Yeah. You know, I went hard like on Earth One travelling and... So then, did that that salary give mm, you the means almost to go travel and do yeah because they paid the expenses as well right okay so what was, was that for the, the goal was for you to create earth one or that was yeah it? okay yeah so, so we didn't own, have any, we didn't know it was going to be called earth until right. until oh, a month before it came out so for their own earth mm, yeah the they 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 paid for the earth series right. yeah yeah okay. yeah. Wow. yeah 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 probably should have known that i didn't know that yeah, no, I, no, I, I actually didn't either. You don't need, no. you need to know all that stuff, do you? No, I mean, I guess. Yeah, it was like Alex ranking. It's like, oh, yeah. Alex's thing. Well, they were always. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were always amazing at putting me, my name on that front. Yeah. You know, from the first video. Yeah. Uh, it was like <laughs> <laughs> because they were interested in Sprung. I think they, Mark wanted to call it Sprung Six. Right. You I know, I was like, yeah. no way, <laughs> you're not doing that. It's yeah. not like it's not me in Milan. That was Sprung, and I wanted to. You know, to have a fresh start and create something new. Yeah. But yeah, they're all about continuing the business and making the it as easy as possible. But what I did bring was all the distribution as well. Right. So they had that massive like, um, you know, straight away you had American distribution. Yeah. Blah, yeah, blah, yeah for yeah. Earth, it was all over the world. Yeah. Straight away, they didn't have to How build. Was marketing film they didn't have to build well. anything. But the, obviously, the beauty of of dirt is you had direct sales like that yeah had people a warehouse yeah. it was getting sent out you know so you had your own inbuilt high profit margins and then all the marketing the free advertising from the and that mm. sort of that Very whole global thing. dirt wasn't it yeah it was and, and tim said that it helped him sell advertising around the world like having right. a legit video like that so it raised the profile of the magazine mm. because what tim will say is and what i used to moan about was a lot with with the money side of things is we couldn't get the sponsorship being from the UK at all. You just can't because you're not, you're irrelevant to them. You're irrelevant to them, <laughs> to the American scene where the market is, is to, to where the industry is. It's, you know, in the UK, we're just another market. Yeah. Why do you feel it's, it's, like it's, completely it's, irrelevant? It's, they're not going to pay for a UK filmmaker when there's American filmmakers. Right. They're going to support their own, you know, not irrelevant because they, there's people that do appreciate what you do and stuff. That's like harsh, but um, I mean, I, I feel like it sort of like rears, rears its head a little bit of what's happened with Brendan the other day. Just everyone, I, I didn't necessarily agree with it 100%, but there's that sort of vibe, a lot of people saying, oh, it's because he's from UK, you know, right. he's not going to get, they're not going to vote for him because he's he's from the UK mm. and they're favoriting, favoriting ties in the Americans and, whether you agree with that or not, I don't think that's, we've talked enough, haven't we? Today <laughs> we get into a whole other <laughs> hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've not even talked about modern World Cup downhills. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah uh, I've got a stupid question. Mm. Um, when did films start giving athletes their own segment? Were you? They always did, didn't they? I don't know. I think they See, did. I just we just watched Sprung Two, and I feel like that was more of like a we're at an event. Here's all these people at that event. Yeah. When did it start? That's, in like because that's, that section? was our style. That was like our style. I think um, I remember like going to America uh, to Australia for Earth Four, and like Rennie's like like yeah we're gonna do like my own section yeah, and he like had it in his head. He wanted it to be like a section. I'm like yeah, all right, if you want. Like, yeah. And then his section come out and there's a load of crashes at the start. He's like calling me up, like, why the hell's a load of crashes <laughs> at, at the start? It's my section, it's my section. It's like, oh, sorry, mate. <laughs> like, oh, really? But I didn't realise, you know, that that's how you felt like about it because it's not like... I like that section, by the way. It's all right, isn't it? And like, it's good, had you the know, manuals, like, had good uh, yeah, music. Yeah, I mean, calming. it's just getting around, like, I guess... There's always been like Earth One, you know, he had a section on there, isn't he? Whistler. Yeah. And he, that's the section, you know, there's no big crashes at the start. So we did do it. Right. You know, and, um, but yeah, our vibe was always just like, for me, I'd rather keep it in a zone. 
yeah. you know, a mountain biking filming. I think someone described it to me. It might have been Cunny or something like that, but he's described, you know, mountain bike. It was Hamish from, uh, used to work at Candel. He was like saying, mountain bike film is like all about zones, you know, rather than breaking it into sections and like pulling a bit from here and a bit there. Mm. I mean, you can do it that way, but you look at like Seminex stuff, he's a sections, but they're very much zones, aren't they? You know, and it's yeah. all like, whereas right, yeah, Seminex, you mean, Seminex yeah. could do a video over a two year period and just do a bit from here, a bit yeah. from there, a bit yeah, from here. And that's like, more like yeah. a skate section, isn't yeah, it? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas, it's zones, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas, and I think like, like for me, if I go to the trails, you know, Ellis from, Chertsey, he was like always used to talk about video sections he's like oh, I, I like what you do because it's all about like just keeping it in that section you yeah. know and like this is what happened on this day and yeah, it's honesty, yeah. and I guess you capture you know? the scene there as well aren't you not just like yeah taking individual bits from yeah and the scene's yeah. important like yeah. as well isn't it yeah. it's like and also it's a lot less commitment from like if you from a rider they need to be in control of that and then say oh I've got this footage from this filmer and this footage from that filmer or or you've got to be really organized with the filmers you know mm -hmm. so like the new or disorder guys they'd be right this you only they because their riders only film with them they don't go off and do stuff with people like me or right. blah 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 you know i mean i remember racers calling me up or speaking to me at a race or whatever and saying oh i've been is it okay i've been filming with the new world i'm like Mate, so I don't know what, what you're on about. Like, oh, because, you know, and then they'd just film with them. They wouldn't film with anyone else from that point on, really. Mm. So I don't see, I never have any ownership on the riders. That's always been a big thing where, like, for me, like, it's a two-way street. I'm not, like, the big film guy who's like, my film's going to be the best film. You're going to come in here. <laughs> We're going to make you know and do this big i've got all the budget and you yeah. know it's not we're going to go to this location it's like oh so what do you want to be in the film what do you want to do and it's always about what the rider wants and and then that two-way thing and and just really like filming the races do stuff when they're not at the races you know a lot of that and yeah the zones and scenes thing i, th I think is like it's more like it's already going on and you're capturing it and then, yeah. and then those those kind of shoots, they're quite different, aren't they? And they feel different for me. Yeah. I, I struggle a little bit with like being radioed to tell you when to drop in or like... Dropping like, in, It yeah. just feels a bit weird. It feels like it's um, mm. making it something else. It's more like Hollywood, isn't it? It's like if you say like when The Collective came out and um, they sort of showed what they did behind the scenes, everyone can see like flying through the trees on a wire and... Yeah, and that's the best thing I've ever seen. And it's like, yeah, because is it because you're flying through the trees on a wire that's the best thing, or is it actually the best thing you've ever yeah. seen? You know what mm. I mean? But it is brilliant, and um, that kind of filmmaking is just one step below what Hollywood would do, isn't it? They yeah. sort of know about riding, but they're just bringing everything that someone from yeah. Hollywood would bring to a shoot, and yeah. that's sort of like amazing for the sport, and it's brought in people that wouldn't have been interested in riding, whereas my stuff's always been for people who are already are into it, mm. you know, or maybe someone who's sort of a bit more punky or likes stuff from a different sort of type of culture. But yeah, yeah. for most people, they see, you know, the, the glossy high-end stuff, mm. and that's going to pique your interest and make you take mountain biking more seriously rather than watching sprung fish eye through a toilet roll <laughs> what the hell's this bunch of mountain bikers beating each other up at a race <laughs> falling yeah. around like I'm not taking this seriously anymore <laughs> but then on the flip side I've been thinking about it a bit lately where I was talking with Harvey um, uh, that's my son by the way who's been sat here for the business partner Two, yeah. two and a half hours completely <laughs> quiet he's the manager if I ever stop halfway through a uh, question it's because Harvey's like this <laughs> just off camera <laughs> he's been so good just reading his little novel yeah. he's only 11 um, wow. so he was we were talk, talking about how is all this sort of you know free ride stuff at the level it is now on the slope style is it really like promoting a sport in the best way that it can in terms of 
nothing wrong with where it's going or what these riders are doing. I mean, it's inc- it's insane, isn't it? But is it really like relatable? And yeah. can is it sort of having actually a negative effect on the amount of people now coming into it? And will people now start going, oh, actually, um, BMX streets looking kind of appealing now because I can just go and Dude. and things things go in swings and roundabouts all the time, don't they? Big, yeah. you know, I'm just waiting for where where always it's heading. Had that. That's one thing I always think this as well. It's like you know you watch a slope style event now and it looks so unobtainable. The features are like you don't see that shit around your local woods. No. So does that prevent people from getting into the sport? I don't. Or no. has it always been like that, and it just keeps evolving and getting bigger and more gnarly? I don't know. I, I'm not sure either, because no, it's, it's not really for us to say either, is it? No. It's for the kid who's now looking for a new hobby, because ultimately you probably get into a sport because you're like, oh, what's going to make me attractive to girls? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? Is that going not to biking. be? <laughs> is that going to be, you know, buying a? Uh, Five thousand pound bike and trying to beat Steve Pete, or is it <laughs> whoever's the top boy now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is it going to be um, buying the same bike probably and trying to yeah. do a eighty foot jump yeah, backflip yeah. over an eighty foot jump? Go viral. Or you or know, go viral. Yeah. Trying to manufacture that. It's it is interesting. That, I don't know it? whether these things really like because it's so like. Really, you can just go to the bike park now, can't you? And, yeah. And, and and do stuff, like, straight away. Mm. And but like you lose something. Being... You do lose... I, I think you do lose something as something. I think, you know, like that, the golden years that people refer to in every sport, what does that mean? What does it mean when people are talking about the golden years? Is it just their favourite period when they were the most receptive to it all? Or... Was there something yeah. about the buzz of it that was like actually? I think it's got to be something about the buzz because I, I think yeah it yeah you can't for people. you can't it's definitely different now if you if you're in if I mean I went to Windhill probably a couple of years ago now but there was like kids there sort of fifteen years old just doing all the big jumps yeah. like it's nothing you know what I mean and I was sort of thinking actually they're quite big jumps you know for for where like my the public park. I was into like BMX and I could get through like decent sized set of trails when I was sort of in my twenties and, um, and that's carried me through, you know, I can now go to bike park and do most stuff, you know, it's not too high risk, mm. but that took me years to learn <laughs> and I'm really yeah. jealous because these kids can just go there and it's all there in front of them. They know exactly how to do it. Yeah. And is it's just a bit too easy for them to have that sort of passion, same passion, but maybe their passion comes in at a higher level now and they've like, so you're into it and then it's actually, you know, I'm really into it now because I'm racing a national or I'm really into it now because I'm, I might get to go and ride something the fest size here, yeah. you know, yeah. or so it's just different. And maybe they're going abroad, you know, you've got that whole Whistler thing, which is insane. And if you go there, your riding comes on like, you know, after a week or two of riding Whistler, you're probably going to be riding Crab Apple and mm-hmm. things like that if you're a kid, you know, which is almost fest series sizes. And so it's kind of, it, you know, it's getting, it's pretty up there, isn't it? And Yeah, it's interesting to think about that, so, about the progression of it and stuff. But yeah. for me, as a, not a wealthy young man, as a young man, and having that disposable income and why I was drawn to, Oh, I've just crashed my BMX. Tra- I've just crashed my mountain bike learning to ride trails. I've broken the brake lever. The brake lever would have cost me forty, fifty quid at the time. I may as well get in, get a BMX then, yeah. you know. And that was around the time I was doing sprung two, I think. <clears throat> and and then I became a BMXer really because it was cheap. Cheaper. I could just throw my bike around. I could chuck it in the car, go to the park. And I've always liked sports I could do from my front door or extremely locally. So then when I moved out doing Sprung 3, I lived in Bath on the same street as um, the skate park, and I just learned to ride ramps, and I used to ride to the trails, you know. Mm. And after a, f- a few months, I was airing, you know, four or five foot out, six foot a quarter, and then that just made me a better, better trials rider. I was sort of tire tapping six foot minis and yeah. f- foo foos, and, mm. and you can just learn, like, the basic skills there. And I, I was sort of... Um, 
it didn't cost me a load of money. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't have to pay yeah, for so your hobby. 50 you quid know. brake lever kind of almost alienated you. It's easy to see how like a 15 grand carbon yeah. e-bike. Yeah, can you imagine? A... Yeah. Yeah. Now kids won't even go riding because they haven't got the right wheel size. Yeah. It's like, oh, I heard there's a new wheel size coming out. Oh, oh, I'm not going to ride my bike until I've got that. Yeah, yeah, or the lucky, <laughs> the lucky things, the next level. So, so that's where I've always been a big advocate, promoter, or sort of of anything where there's sort of cheaper, you know. Yeah. And it's sort of. I'm with you. Was yeah. that? Any yeah. bike you can get a f- decent full size bike for a grand caliber, boss, whatever it is. Yeah, boss. they're bringing that back. Boss nut, it's coming back. Boss nut, is yeah, it? it's yeah. not been around for a bit. Yeah, I was talking to the guy the other day. The boss nut is coming back. I think that could be the big growth yeah, area, focus, really. Yeah. For <laughs> so, yeah. Where do you see how it's portrayed? Mm. Right, you see, you not just m- moving on in chapters as we have been. Yeah. But you did stuff for Freecaster, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you you have an interest in obviously you have an interest anyway in how the sports like portrayed uh, race wise and event wise throughout all of your videos, but like. Freecaster, what did, what did you do for Freecaster? You did. Well, Will, Will came up to me in like 2004 and he said, I've got this big screen down there. Do you want some stuff? We've got some stuff we could put on it. I'm like, yeah, all right. He's like, yeah, and we're trying to put live coverage on the screen, on the web, all around the world. I'm like, oh, that sounds all right. That was a year before YouTube, 2004. So yeah. it was amazing, yeah? yeah? And that was Will, Ockerton, and Ray. And. Um, and, and and then we've always just been mates, yeah? Yeah. And then when I went, I left um, 4130 after Factory. It became Factory Media. Mm-hmm. A little bit disillusioned with the Factory Media thing, but uh, went freelance, you know. I did had a really good few years being freelance. And then um, I did the last year, I did the whole season with Will uh, 2011 with Freecaster. Yeah. So it was like traveling with Rob, traveling yeah. with Will, <laughs> like dragging them out of bars and <laughs> stuff, you know. And uh, and that was, but that was the last full season I did actually. Right. And, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That like, ties in well to your like, like interest a, in live TV or whatever, doesn't it? Was it? Like yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, really. Like, um, but I didn't really have anything to do with that side of things. Right. You know, so I was always really passionate about that kind of stuff for sure. Yeah. What did and, you do um, at Freecast then? Were you I was just like the guy that would film, you know, like a did like i uh, filming right and then i'd go and do like an edit in the evening which okay. is like the free caster thing so it's like really hard work yeah. and then at the start of the season i'm up till like 3 30 yeah you know here you are we all knocking on his door here's the thing <laughs> <laughs> you know and then by the end of the season you're like sort of 9 30 right go for dinner or even before <laughs> you know you're like right just all done then just <laughs> yeah. together here you go <laughs> 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 right, let's go for dinner uh-huh. and um yeah, because you're like really organised. Mm. I mean, of course, sort of start of the season, Will's like, oh, can you do this thing for Monster Energy? It's like, yeah, just a 10 minute documentary about her. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was cool. You know, I really liked coming back. And it was weird because, like, from 2008 was like the last full season I did. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> 2007 was Earth 5. 2007, I went freelance. 2008, I went freelance. I did like the first web clips for like companies, wow. you know. So that was like Santa Cruz web clips, yeah, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Two thousand nine, I just sort of my daughter was born, Annabelle. So I was like, right, sacked all off for traveling, and I just stayed in the UK and did like man- motorbike enduro stuff. Um, um, I think did I do schoolboy motocross for Red Bull then? Oh, so did they, you? yeah, I think I was just sort of got into that. I did like they. Remember the Afton project that Clay did? Yeah, they were already doing that, and then I, they asked me to come in and do a, a similar thing for Schoolboy Motocross, and we called it Dirt Rats. Yeah, and that was um, just following all them, and it was really weird because they. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I forgot about it. Red, I Red Bull didn't have a clue what they were doing. It was really funny, and they were starting up this Red Bull Media House thing. Mm. Yeah, and they wanted content. It won't it stick. It won't <laughs> stick. <It's laughs> fizzy drink. It won't. It won't. <laughs> and they were. They were hilarious because they, they wanted me to f- do this whole thing. They paid for me to do it, you know, good money. And um, and it's filming schoolboy motocrosses, right, who are all under 16. Yeah. And then, like, halfway through this season, they're like, 
Oh, actually, um, we can't promote Red Bull to anyone under 16. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, yeah. like, they didn't know what they, but they still promoted, they still paid for a second season. Who was it? And it was all mad. But they were just using me and others, uh, content producers, to create content for the media house. Yeah, right. And then, like, have a workflow. So I was kind of, like, kind of pro. I, like, knew about, like, workflows. I knew about different media formats. And delivering in different formats and, and not just some like some goofball like um film not say goofball not just some like naive kid who doesn't know about professional level stuff because so yeah. of my training of five years of media studies i know about workflows and processes that in the background like of course like content producers now it's all like normal to them like oh your kit here is insane you know what i mean but back then there was a lot of sketchy different right. filmers, whereas I knew about how to deliver this stuff for them. So they wanted everything in set formats, right, you know, okay. like, so it's like, we want this format and the audio on different channels yeah. and all this. And so okay. I could do all that and then deliver it for the Red Bull Media House. And then we had this sort of to and fro. And that's just yeah. what they were paying me to do whilst sort of like figuring out the communication between like their staff and people like me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then they have a set way of, so, right, when we talk to our staff, we can teach them how to speak to producers. Yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Now, I used to get invited to, like, meetings in London at Red Bull. Like, oh, you've got to come in for a meeting. It's essential. And I'd be there, and there'd be all these other production house people there. And I'm like, oh, I sort of, like, feel, like, pretty rad because it's, like, so-and-so from really big TV company. Yeah, yeah, So-and-so yeah. from, like, this really cool, like, guy who's doing, like, urban videos for, like, you know street culture stuff in the uk and like i like love to spend more time in a room with these people yeah and <laughs> like draw up some business and mm -hmm. and um uh you know and then red bull they sit sit down what make you watch a video and it's like this is what we call a cutaway and this is how we do this and this is how we refer so they're sort of trying to create the the language the communication Right, to communicate yeah, yeah, with these yeah. producers and this one producer woman was sat there and after about i'm not kidding you like 30 seconds she's like how long we have for a beer for this <laughs> like that and after about two minutes she'd gone she was like i don't have to be here and she just walked out wow. so i mean she figured out that they were just red bull being like you know control freaks mm. sort of thing and then i i worked out that i was communicating because their whole thing fell apart like uploading these media house videos they were trying to get it, so right. Even though it was like really wasn't important, they were like really wanted it up. That like the race is finished, edited, get it up three days later. You know what I mean? It was that kind of vibe. Yeah. And like we've got to get the feedback. We've got to get it online. And I was like, okay, yes, let's do it. And I'm being like super pro, trying to get it all done. You know, re reviews, communication, da da da. And then the video was completely different from how it was first sent. You know, I was like, oh, I'm pretty pleased with that. You know, sort of seven or eight minutes long. Yeah, I like that, really good, you know. And then, no, 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 no. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, after coming like from after coming like from Earth, where I had like 100% control yeah, over yeah. everything, and you're like, right. <laughs> 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 well, I don't like that. That was the best bit, you know. And like, fair enough. And then you kind of maybe try and fight your corner for a little bit and then realise really quickly there's no point. Yeah. And you just like roll over. And that changed me as a filmer. You know what I mean? So you go from someone who's like got like low, real high opinion of yeah, you being able to like, like just sort of like smash out a load of good stuff yeah, and to like, all right, now that's how they want it. And yeah. it was not so much, you know, I, I'm fine with that though. Like I've sort of like a process I wanted to go through to, to make that, you know, to change myself. You know, like when I first went freelance, I was like, right, I never use tripod ever. But when I first went freelance, I just spent the whole year just on doing tripod stuff yeah. and became really, really good at it. So I, bought, I bought like a really nice tripod and just did everything like real cinematic. I did like a, I did like a Kawasaki commercial by the end of the year. And I got like paid like more money than I got for, I got one for one video. I bought like my new van and no I paid way, off, yeah. <laughs> paid bought all like new kit. I got more money for one job than I had like for the whole year <laughs> before wow. you know what i mean working for 4130 for like one job yeah so and then i sort of that wasn't really for me and that was still half the price of what kawasaki were paying before 
<laughs> yeah. And then what happened was the, year, the, the following year, someone else came in and said, oh, I'll do it for half of that. I'll do it half of what Alex did. <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of like, and then someone did it to that guy. You know what I mean? And then it's just the race to the bottom, isn't yeah. it? And then slowly I think it's going back up mm -hmm. now. So, so yeah, the free caster stuff was, was really fun. That was a real fun year for me. And there was what, Danny Hart, just run at yeah. Champry. Yeah. How does he sit down with balls that big? And yeah. So were you doing, were you doing like the angles and stuff, like where they had the cameras? No, but you know, was, I, I always, when I first went freelance, and the, the earth years before I went freelance, I was kind of like trying to line myself up yeah. to sort of maybe have it like be a consultant or something. I don't know why yeah. I thought you were doing. I, I no. thought that was what you were doing. I was trying to like I was friendly with Flo, the director, but that was kind yeah. of his job. Right. You know, that was his job and that's yeah. what he was paid to do. Right. So there's no way like he's going to say, oh, yes, we need to pay Alex a thousand pounds a day <laughs> yeah, to tell yeah. us where to put the cameras. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. It's not going to happen, is it? And like, I'd love to have had a pop at that. You yeah. I'd love to, I still would. So, yeah. you know, it would be awesome. And, and, um, and, uh, I would, uh, you know, that would be my dream job. But, um, yeah, with the free caster stuff, it was still Flo and his crew doing it and all that. And I just, I just, um, I just, uh, you know, did, I was actually a bit confused in that year because I was, I remember, uh, um, I was in South Africa filming on just getting my practice stuff. And yeah. the goal was for me to make a DVD at the end of the year. Mm. So I was just filming my practice. I was halfway through practice and the radio kick cracks in or my phone goes. And it's like, Alex, can you come down to the finish area? We're, we're doing an interview with so-and-so. And they pulled me away to do all the free caster type stuff, you know, which they'd been right. used to doing to create their like their content for the, wrap up. the nightly shows or whatever. Right. So it kind of didn't really work for me in that regard. And then I think after about three or four races, I said to Will, look, this is a bit weird, you know, because I need to get the riding footage. And then he was like, yeah, yeah, just do that then. Forget all the other. We'll just focus on you getting the riding footage. Mm. But then by the end of the year, the DVD, by the time the DVD came out, Freecast was going to be done and dusted. Right. It was the end of their contract. That was like the big focus. I wasn't really sure how to make the DVD. Like I could have made it like earthed and just had my footage, but then it's not really, the, it's not really the free cast of DVD then, is it? So I mm. made it like really long with all the coverage and then just my stuff like sprinkled in. Okay. Yeah. It's really diluted my stuff. Mm. And, and then, like I said, like the first couple of races, it wasn't really good enough anyway. So that's kind of why I went that route. I had like the TV footage being the focus. You know, right, rather yeah, than yeah, trying yeah. to make a, like a Earth six for freecast or something. Yeah, I guess you have to film an awful lot to make an Earth. Like, like yeah, you've got to run around and not miss. You know, you think like it's just one, it's just me filming and all. Yeah. I've got an interesting you know, question. So, I think. I mean, I had Vanessa at the finish, or you know, sometimes I have, I give the small camera to someone. You know, so. As a YouTuber. I got to get the dog out in a minute as well. Right, no worries. Yeah. As a YouTuber, okay. I probably film like nineteen. I, I probably film like thirty minutes of footage and then turn it into ten. Mm. And that's like approximately when I put all of my footage in. That's probably what I normally do. And we we talk about it like me and Brent talk about how much you can get it down. And when you when you're actually filming, how conscious you are of kind of cutting whilst Stop, you're yeah. yeah whilst you're filming. Like with something like Earth, I assume that. It is like two minutes. It is like hours. Yeah. Well, that was actually a bit longer. Like sprung, it used to be really, really, really strict. Yeah. Like it would be like one section of World Cup mountain bike track, the best rider, and yeah. that was it. Yeah. So really, on the tapes, there's probably a lot more good riders coming through. You know. And you spend a day on the hill for that. Yeah. Well, you move around. What we do is to, to cover to cover the whole as much of the track as possible. We'd like, we used to just discuss this stuff, Milan and I. We'd be like, all right. And I was guilty. I used to stay in the same place for too long. And he'd be like, no, you've got to move more quick. As soon as you get one good one come through, get to the next good bit of track. Good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the World Cup. One of the good, get one of the good riders. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that goes back to how p picky we were, you know, yeah, how yeah, choosy, yeah. you know. But then, yeah, so, 
yeah, someone who got it nice. Yeah, you know yeah I understand. Mean? But you know, because <laughs> like, if you were on a tricky section, but then really that's where the gold was, wasn't it? Like it was yeah. like people coming through and then we learned that over the time as well. You you get like people would struggle and yeah. like sometimes you'd walk down the track and you'd hear people cheering from far away. You're like, oh, what's going on there? Yeah, well, that looks good, you know, and you just rush past all the, you know, maybe it's the first time I've seen the track. It's before your days of track walking. And you just like, oh, yeah, I remember that for later. And then you get there and there'd be like a crowd of people all cheering because it was like the tricky bit of the track. The crash section. And yeah. that's where everyone was, like, because the pros would come through. Caserama. Yeah, maybe, you know. <laughs> you know, true. that was like a standout, that's wasn't a it? Section, but yeah. for, for For a jump, yeah, but... It would always be like some root section, and yeah. Yeah. so so what I'm doing now, I'm going back through some of the old tapes, and sometimes that's what stands out is like there's a root section um, where everyone was struggling for the morning, yeah, and I'd I'd have actually spent two and a half hours there in in the earth days, you know, so some sprung I'm it was more strict, and then with earth actually the World Cup section would would be six seven minutes long, a bit longer, so there's more yeah. time to play with, and you could compare the different riders on the same sections and stuff like that. So so you get more into it. It was more focused on on the World Cups and the racing art. So you you're know. looking through that stuff now? Yeah, yeah. Like Rad. I've got, I borrowed a really, really, really expensive tape deck off <laughs> my friend and, um, and then I'm recording it all to like hard drive direct to this little, um, I don't even have to trouble the computer. It goes straight to my Ninja V. Oh, wow. <laughs> via SDI. So is that so with a view to do stuff with it? Yeah, so um, what are you working on? Yeah. Um, well, just Seed like... it up, go on, knock it out of the box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to announce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Nah. It's just, whatever, I'm just figuring it out at the moment, to be honest. So just, I've always had a YouTube, right? Mm. I've had YouTube since the start, and I was one of the first YouTube You're a directors. I was one of the first YouTube directors in the country. What, was, what do you say? A YouTuber? You're a YouTuber. What's that? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I've never heard of that. Is that a new thing? <laughs> but they, they contacted me years ago and said, do you want to earn money from YouTube? I'm like, well, they, they, they identified that my videos were eligible. Right. And then they put me on the director scheme if I just signed up for Google Ad, AdSense or whatever. Yeah. I've had that since the start. And then I even got invited to a thing in, it's probably one of the biggest career mistakes. <laughs> they invited me to a thing in London, probably in like, must be like 2011 or something like that. Wow. And, they, and I thought it was a, a scam email. <laughs> I thought it was like a, a, you know, a scammer or something. So I just, I replied, you know, and I said, is this real? Da, da, da. And they never replied. And then... Um, so what was the thing? And then something came back. There's like they were like, it was just like um, a conference, you know, like, like a creator, for, yeah, for directors to go and and get, you know, and find out what this things go. But I guess I've had, I've actually had quite a lot of money off YouTube over the years. <laughs> and um, I had one video that's done. Yeah, five, you got one that's five mil, haven't you? Five million, yeah. And all the most of the comments are like, that music's rubbish. <laughs> 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 Which, to be fair, is true. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> What do you uh, think of it though? Like, I'd be curious. Yeah, I know we got to look towards wrapping up soon, but like, what's your view now of this like YouTube generation, the big YouTubers and stuff? Well, it's mad, isn't it? I think it's fine. I like it. I mean, I think you consume it. I I do, yeah, because I need to know how to do stuff. So I literally, yeah, everything's on there, isn't it? Like whether it's a new editing thing or a a camera review, Mm. something to DIY. Yeah, yeah, you can build a house. I mean, my friend built his beautiful garden shed off the back of a YouTube videos in America. What about bike stuff? Do you consume like any... Certain amount... Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I watch... Is it the Ride Companion? Yeah, yeah. Do a good answer. Yeah, I that's good. That. I watch that sometimes. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's appreciated. Um, I, I think... Uh, I do watch stuff. I don't pay for anything, so I don't watch World Cups anymore. Okay. Interesting. Do you have to pay for World Cups? Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Yeah. And that's weird. So I just pick it up off in Instagram. Um, if there was a decent sort of outlet for that, I think Clay mentioned about doing, like, a drive to survive. I'm surprised, like, there isn't already something announced or isn't had been, like, something running this year already through the season, like, because uh, um, Discovery, like, Masters of, like, um, you know, what was it? 
What's the TV shows I like? Have huh? the fishing one, Dead Catch. Deadliest yeah, Catch. Yeah, You're right. That's a good you know, thought of that. Yeah, they it's are true, massive documentaries. Yeah, you know, and you've got all the that's so true gold. Yeah, gold, yeah. gold yeah. ones, gold rush things. You're right, man. They are massive. Alaska, Alaska, yeah. Last Frontier. Yeah, Ice Road Truckers. I love all that's that. That's what mountain biking yeah. needs. And Ice Road Truckers. I love all that. Is it because we're in it? But I feel like self-employed TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because we're in it, or does mountain biking seem like it's like got a real strong following? Like, is it is it is that just me talking about the bubble? They've got that to be I'm careful. They've got to be careful right now. Like, they've got they've got a really good opportunity to really easily make it massive. And I'm sure there's something in the background where they have got like drive drive to survive. This is a question I think we keep asking. If like, they there haven't, must be something. But then you see like if they haven't got it lined up, what's happening? I did not. message Chris about have you got an end of year edit? going on do you need an editor <laughs> yeah if they i don't care who edits it but mm. i'm there if you want someone to watch it help but um it's like i'm sure they've got it happening it's got to be happening and if it isn't then it will be you know it's yeah i i think um i was watching i was a vital podcast about the state of the the mountain bike stuff i wouldn't I only listen to it because i was coming on here i wouldn't listen to that stuff all the time because it feels like kids stuff talking about like oh who said you should be at this part of the track and then no one said they were going to be there you know it's all they're moaning about little things to do with racing that are really irrelevant i think and like yeah there's been some big changes how does it look for your average person who used to consume it how is it now you're always going to have problems with one thing to another but like the biggest thing that I've seen that everyone moaning about is this semi-final thing. And that's actually, when I saw they'd announced that, I actually thought that was a bit annoying because changing downhill, it's obvious you shouldn't change downhill, isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's like the fundamental thing. It's like, no, it's like you do one fast run a day. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's it. You know, yeah, it's qualities for, to figure out, you know, sort out the top 80, you know, to really sort out the, you know, it's a bit of a battle for those boys at that, yeah. at that end of the field. But really, you don't want to put that much pressure on the on the elites, you know. And mm. So I think that was a bit of a mess up. And I lost a lot of interest, actually, uh, because of that. I think, personally, I thought the semi-final thing was just really weird. So I was a dummy. I was excited I think, for more racing. And then I've mm, been proven yeah. really? that it's too yeah. confusing. I can't but keep I've up not, with it. Because of the way you have to pay or whatever, I've not bothered. So it doesn't actually affect me anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah. true, yeah. Yeah, I saw Rachel too. Atherton, she had a moan about it really on in the season. And she, you know, kind of speaks her mind. And she's been around a lot, you yeah. know, in terms of experience and what works and the pressure that races are under. So you just need to listen to people like that and you won't go wrong. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, you don't need to listen to people like me, for Christ's sake. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, I don't know, I disagree, to be honest. You've been, yeah. uh, been around it, you know what works, what doesn't. Maybe when it comes to where uh, the camera should be. But well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah there you, you know, go. Yeah. So yeah, um, I think we need to look towards wrapping up, don't we? But yeah. is there anything? I, I had an idea. I think it'd be super sick for our listeners or watchers to do a sprung party because we should have done one earlier. You can sit all of your all sprung is on YouTube. Mm. Earth's on YouTube too. On yeah, your well, I'm dripping them out to my channel. So, so if someone, people should do it. Going a sprung back to party, the YouTube thing, I'm slowly like reinvigorating my YouTube because it's. Man. I think it's, it's going to be an easy way to make like millions and millions yeah yeah, That's yeah, I, think so, yeah. Mate, yeah I mean millions. Look, I think so yeah millions, i've seen yeah. i've seen the rolls royce house like <laughs> and um <It's> similar <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know about millions um but yeah. no but yeah no so i don't like unearthed yeah yeah going through the tapes just like unearthing the tapes so oh, that's so cool you yeah. know genius genius, genius. <laughs> no, uh, the extras on earth one were actually called unearthed yeah, they yeah, were. They yeah, were. yeah. That's the first DVD menu, mate. Yeah, that changed everything. Was it on the DVD menu? Yeah, Extras? probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I made all that myself. Yeah, yeah. Wow. that's why they were shit. <laughs> 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 but no, nah, I think it'd be cool, man. People should do that. Like it's winter, especially in the UK. Hang out with your friends, get the boys round, yeah. all the girls, or whatever, and watch, yeah. have a sprung party. Yeah. Watch all five, hang out, order some pizza. Dude, yeah. What a lovely evening in. Yeah. And, w and whether you're reminiscing yeah. or you're or bright discovering. eyed or discovering exactly where everything came from, it's a great watch. Well, what, what I've done is I've done sprung video and I've got 
I've had that for ages, sprung a video on YouTube. Yeah. And I, and I did that probably five years ago, six years ago now. And, um, and then that's just it. I've not really updated it or kept it going. I had yeah. thought about sort of promoting that loads more, but then really like Alex Rankin, my main channel, I've got 7,000, 8,000 subscribers there already. So I thought I may as well promote that. So what I could do is I could put the sprungs on my own channel and have like a premiere party for those yeah going forward do like one a week or something like that and people could just jump on and chat so if i promote that on my insta and people could just go on yeah Yeah, the chat function's so fun as well like when he's good yeah so so then i've got earth one and twos on there now and then i'm going to put three four and five on as soon as and then start going back because obviously i can't the music i won't get any money from those Uh, yeah of course because of the music on them all um yeah, even if we, rhymes, it's gonna even, if, paycheck, isn't it? even if we <laughs> cleared it all back then, it's still someone's going to claim it now. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, I've got yeah. videos on YouTube that have been, I've had getting money off for the last sort of ten years or more, and then only li- literally like two weeks ago, Sony oh claimed it. Yeah, they bought it. It's like they've got AI finding all, any That's track. That's mad, that is, isn't it? And buying the rights to any track. Yeah, because there's no way that a human could like retrospect because there's like really obscure bands from like years ago that i just messaged and the, the music's definitely not gone anywhere yeah, since yeah. then you know so yeah. it's like must be ai is the big thing we should spend the next 30 minutes Please. talking about ai no, <laughs> let's. i've actually I, I would be up for it but your manager's just been like <laughs> but he's told me we do have to talk about something we he's been indicating what we need to talk about have you got it there actually you have got it there yeah we need to do an advert for the merchandise <laughs> do you want to do it <laughs> no, I think he was saying we, uh, we need told to. Him he's not allowed to be but on. You, these these are available, right? How's that? How's that? These I've are got one. Yeah, there's a couple left. I've yeah. Got one now. There's only a couple. I was going to do some hoodies. Oh uh, yeah. Some other stuff. Yeah. And I've got like a simpler logo as well. Like a. Which one? This one here. No, that's the Sprung Four logo. Yeah. Funny you should mention that. Yeah. So sick. A nice gift there. That is an amazing gift, isn't it? Let's. If you ever want to look like a mountain biker down the pub. Sprung tea has got to be the vibe, hasn't it? it? It's probably the one, yeah. It's probably the That's one. That's the one you strike up a conversation yeah. with, yeah. with the You're gonna find hairy right bloke at the so that, that poster, <laughs> pads. That poster's a Paul Bliss original. Shout out to Paul Bliss. You should have him on. If you just want to talk about mountain bike culture yeah. and motorbike culture for, yeah, and where that's going, you should definitely have him on. It'd be like blow your mind. And then um, Rich Barlow from 2000 Sprung 4, Paul Bliss photo. This should have been the Sprung 4 cover on the UK release, but we kind of it slipped through the net somehow, and we had the Dom doing that tuck yeah. over the thing. I think we thought we wanted something more extreme looking. And then on the American, then this got made a poster, and we're like, we should have made that the cover. <laughs> <laughs> and then this made, on the cover for the Sprung American release, on the carton art, which is way better than the UK one anyway, which is just the plastic jewel art, yeah. you know, that. Like, <laughs> The, the carton one has got this on it. It looks so good. And I've got one unopened still. Maybe. Oh, rad. Yeah. But I've kept these posters since 2000. Absolutely mint condition, rolled up. Like, and then I put some on my Instagram the other day and I said, I'm going to sell them, highest bidder. And no one wanted one. <laughs> yeah. I had one guy. Yes, yeah. One guy said he'd pay 50 quid for one, which was super nice of him. Nice. He was just trying to help. I think he just felt sorry for me. <laughs> and then one guy said oh, why don't you just sell them for 10 quid? Put them on, like, do some cheap ones and sell them for a tenner. <laughs> <Do you, laughs> so, I'm like, hey, I didn't keep this poster for 20 no. years. <laughs> 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 it's meant to go then, up. Yeah. Value, yeah. And, like, he's got a point, fair enough. You know what I mean? He has got a point. Like, nah, that's sick, man. Um, so if anyone does want one facts. of these, where can they go? Do you have, you got a website or do you I just was, use social? I was going to sell them framed. Yeah. I thought maybe some of that, but just hit Signed. me hit me up on Insta and DM me and then... Sign framed one of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a bit more than 10 quid. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> That's the pricing structure. We'll speak to the bit manager. More than 10 quid. The, the manager's going to sort He'll of price sort it out. So, out um, reply to the DMs. It just reminded me, like, I was trying to start up my own little thing there and, like, create a business or whatever, but... Um, it reminded me how gnarly it is actually doing that because you get people like like that guy, fair enough, you know, he had a point, but people <laughs> say like stuff, don't they? Like, oh, I want that frame in that Dude. colour with that wheel size. 
all the time it's hardcore isn't it nowadays yeah. like people just go on instagram and just think just do a set product dude like have them framed black black frame white background fr- signed mm. and Sorry. everyone who asked for a t-shirt so far has been absolutely lovely Sick. like so people good. like really, really nice. i was gonna do shopify to make it easier yeah because i think i found the limit of the number of people that were willing to message alex rankin directly to order something <laughs> And now there's probably like another level behind that of people who just quite happily click on something to order. Yeah, you know. for sure. So, yeah, that's sure. going to be the next thing. Mate, get it, get it fired up. And then obviously all of the links for you, YouTube, will be in our show description. Um, and I think we've got to do another one. Like We didn't even talk about it. I think we've got to do another one. I felt this way the last, the last two guests, actually. I've been like... Normally, normally I, I'm keen for being short and snappy, but I feel like maybe we're turning into a three-hour podcast. I don't know. Let us know in the comments. Okay, you want it. <laughs> <laughs> Are we? <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask the crew. What they yeah, well, I think we will, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe get some bigger memory cards. <laughs> Man needs a coffee down there. Yeah. <laughs> Many thanks, yeah, Alex, thank for everything. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for everything you've done. Like, I probably wouldn't be sat here if it weren't for you. Yeah, I wouldn't too, right. I wouldn't oh, amazing, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. be sat here if it weren't for you. Well, next time we'll talk about Earth and the true nature of reality. Oh, the AI episode. <laughs> Peace and love. Peace and love. Like and subscribe. Oh, I feel a bit deflated now. I feel like it's all coming to an end. This oh, episode's doesn't have finishing. To. It... No? No. People can watch another clip if they want. It's down there. E- that easy? Down here? somewhere yeah. uh, they can subscribe up there is it that easy yeah. yeah yeah they can follow us on Instagram at the ride companion that's true they can follow you personally at OW underscore 23 yeah, yeah. Uh, they can check out the website oh it'd be nice if they did actually. sign up to the mailing list so what you're saying is it just continues yeah oh that's alright so the podcast just continues into real life yeah we just integrate it into the real life I've had an idea people. actually what? We, could con- we could continue it into real life even more Ooh. in Mexico Am I right? Oh, mate. If you want to come on holiday with us, we're going to eat tacos, ride bikes in Oaxaca uh, in December, then head to the website, find out more information, or in the show description, there is more details. Man, does that sound good. Arriba. <laughs> that is, that's it. That's your Spanish. <laughs> See. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Like and subscribe. Peace.